Okay. Here we are, live again. We are here every Thursday, 11.30 a.m. L.A. time, Los Angeles time, right? So, um, yeah, make sure my mic is good. Um, I was having some issues with it the other day. Should be fine now, hopefully. Um, and I also just updated to Windows 11, unfortunately. So here we are. Uh, we'll start with some recent comments because we had some interesting ones here. Until we get some more people in. Comments, not analytics. Okay, so um, one question um, was about words like didn't, shouldn't, couldn't, wouldn't. Um, I'm just going to paste this here. Hello, Gabriel. Uh, better than you? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> uh, it doesn't sound like you're doing too good. Um, hope you're doing okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, things are all right. Um, A is back. Uh, yeah, good question. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'll answer this first um, before I get to the didn't, shouldn't, wouldn't, all that stuff. Um, so there's more than one answer. Okay, there's more than one answer. Fully enunciated. Remember, there's there's the fully enunciated version of a word, and then there's the normal version of a word. And that doesn't apply for all words necessarily. Sometimes the fully enunciated version is the, the normal way to say it, but we have many, many cases due to certain linking rules that can apply inside words and, and things that can happen. Um, there are many cases where the fully enunciated version is different than the normal version. And the fully enunciated version is always possible. It can always come out. If it just happens that way, it happens that way, even in the flow of normal speech. Um, that's perfectly fine, um, especially if we want that particular word to be a little clearer and understood, we might go ahead and enunciate, uh, use the enunciated form in the flow of speech to make sure that that one word is clear. Um, for example, that could happen between 13 and 30. Um, you know, we, we might say 13 and really emphasize that T part, um, even though in that case, we don't change the T. It's just because the teen and the flap D to E and 30, three zero, can sound kind of similar. Um, anyway, for the word 20, the fully enunciated version is 20. Well, it's actually E with an E, 20, 20, 20. Um, you can also use a schwa 20, 20, that's fine. So you can reduce that vowel or not. It doesn't really matter in the fully enunciated version. Um, I guess technically the fully, fully enunciated version would be with E. Um, but as for the T, um, the fully enunciated version is where you push out the T, 20, 20, 20, and it's a weak T, or 20, 20. Okay, um, for a D, if I say 20, 20, no, no D. Okay, the D doesn't work there. Um, there's no reason to change the T into a D. We don't just randomly change T's into D's. Um, there are certain cases where, say, if there's like an S and a T or um, like a K and a T, like an actor or, or a stop or whatever, where it, it weakens the T and it can kind of sound very similar to a weak D. Um, so that's one case, one special case of combination of sounds. Um, and then, of course, we know like the preposition to, like go to could be go to, where it turns into a flat D. So there are times where a T can turn into a D. Um, or turn into something that sounds kind of like a D, but we don't just randomly change T's into D's. So this T does not change into a D. There's no reason to do that. There's nothing that could, could make it into a D. Um, but what do we have here? We have NP plus vowel, this linking rule. That's not a plus sign. NP plus vowel. And this linking rule will apply I would say all the time between words. Again, the fully enunciated version is always possible, but there, there's no exceptions. Like you can always apply it between words um, if you have NT at the end of a word and a vowel at the start of the next word. But this rule also usually applies inside of a word. Um, 
And so we have NT, and then there's the Y. It's spelled with a Y, but it's the E sound, okay, which is a vowel. It's not the Y sound. So 20, 20, or you can even keep the E instead of reducing E to 20, 20. It, it doesn't matter. So there's really four ways to pronounce it. Uh, 20, 20 with a schwa, 20, dropping the T, and 20, reducing to a schwa and dropping the T. And it doesn't matter. All four of those are possible. Whichever one comes out is whichever one comes out. It doesn't really matter, okay? Um, but probably more often than not, we're going to drop the T. Um, and more often than not, we're probably going to reduce E to a. Which is kind of weird because usually that doesn't happen in a stressed syllable, but there are times like this where it does. So, um, so the most common way to say it would probably be a uh, plus a drop t twenty. Uh, but again, any of those are possible, and it really does not matter which one comes out. So, long answer to a seemingly simple question, but there you go. That covers all the the versions of that. Um, and I know that makes it seem complicated. It is complex. Um, it might seem kind of overwhelming sometimes, but remember the pronunciation is dynamic and there are certain things like we have the NT plus vowel rule that can apply inside this word. And so that gives us more variations compared to the fully enunciated, right? Fully enunciated should be 20 because there's a T there. But then we can apply this linking rule and it gives us more than one way to say it. So that's all that's happening. It's it's not like you have to memorize all these details. It's just, oh, okay, that makes sense because we have this rule that could apply. But there's also the, the fully enunciated version and they both exist. Okay. So it's not that complicated. It just seems like a lot. Okay. Anyway. Um, so somebody asked recently in one of the comments, um, actually this morning, I think, didn't, shouldn't, wouldn't, and couldn't. Um, hello, Daniela, welcome. Um, didn't, shouldn't, wouldn't, and couldn't. Is the D silent or is the D a stop D? And my answer was that it could be either. It could also be a flat D. Um, I think I talked about this in the last live, um, and we're talking about that second D, right? So in didn't, the first D isn't what we're talking about. So um, I'm not gonna go too deep into this because I've talked about it before, but for the, um, uh, for the, the silent D, that would be like a, a faster, lazier way to say it. Didn't, 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 didn't. Um, shouldn't, shouldn't, wouldn't, couldn't. Um, and technically, here you could actually call that a stop D. Um, you can look at it both ways in this particular case. It's kind of a gray area. Um, but if, if you're trying to like actually stop, stop it, like didn't didn't instead of didn't, 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 where there's like a little bit more of a of a, a, a nasal plosive there because we're going from the D to the N and they're both voiced. Um, that can make it a little stronger. That would technically be the stop. Um, and the difference in sound is so small, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, uh, or of course you can flap it because we have I plus int, right? That NT, we usually tend to put a little I or a uh between the the d and the int um, and so we can say didn't flap that d shouldn't wouldn't couldn't and it doesn't matter which one you use all of these are possible okay it's not formal informal um, they're just different variations based on different things that can happen um, you can also do uh, wait didn't yeah anyway um, okay what what or what um, yeah, so I get this question sometimes. Um, so it's definitely not ah, right? <laughs> um, there is, uh, I've thought about this a little bit more. Um, some people, uh, some, some American speakers, I think most of them are Southerners, um, but there are some people, I think, who maybe aren't Southerners, um, who will, when they say a word like what, um, they say it kind of like what, what, what. And it's not ah, it's it's um, it's a sort of other thing. The IPA symbol is sort of like, I think it's like an upside down lowercase a with two dots or something like that. I don't know. It really doesn't matter. Um, Harney John, welcome. Uh, <clears throat> and you don't have to say it that way. Um, in fact, to me, that sounds like a, an accent. Um, that's why I say, like, I think a lot of Southerners say it that way. 
Um, not that all Southerners say it that way, but I would associate that pronunciation more with the South. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Hello, Delio. Um, doing pretty well. Hope you're well as well. Um, and so the way that I teach this word um, and the way that I speak is it, it's a schwa, whether that's a true schwa or not a true schwa. So remember, when I say schwa, whoops, that's not spelled right, schwa. Um, as I've said in my, my lesson, um, I've talked about, I have the schwa lesson and I have a lesson called the truth about the schwa, where I talk about how the IPA symbols, the upside down E and the upside down V um, in American English, they're basically the same sound. And they're actually two points of the full range of one sound. So um, if you tend to stress or emphasize a word that has the schwa, um, that like that upside down E, like of, if I say of very clearly for some reason, it's going to open more, it's going to become more that upside down V, of, of, of. But if I say, um, let's see, what's a stress word that has, okay, so hut, that has the upside down V, if I say that faster um, and maybe more lazily, hut, 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 it becomes an actual upside down E, a true schwa. So I use the term, the same term for both of those and if I need to specify, then I'll say like the true schwa is the IPA symbol, the upside down E, and then the not true schwa or the upside down V is the other one, but they're basically the same sound. Um, so for what, uh, it depends on how you're saying it. Usually, so if what is in a question, what question, um, then it's gonna be stressed, right? If I say, what do you like? What do you like? What do you like? So it's probably going to be a little bit more open. It's supposed to be a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, what, 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 not a uh, or anything like that. It's upside down V, what, what. Um, but if I'm speaking really quickly, it can still sort of co come into that that uh, that schwa sound. It doesn't really matter. Again, it's the full range of one sound. What do you want? What, 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 what do you want? What do you want? What do you like? What do you like? Okay. Um, so even if it's stressed, it doesn't particularly matter. Okay. Um, cause I know a lot of teachers tell you like, okay, the schwa is never stressed and this upside down V sometimes it's stressed, sometimes it's not forget all of that nonsense. Okay. They're just part of the same sound and which one comes out will just depend on how clearly you're saying the particular word that has one of those two symbols. Um, it's just a range. Okay. So, um, if you're saying what in a statement, right, where it's not actually a question. So if I say, um, is that what you want? Okay, so I'm saying, is that the thing that you want? So instead of saying the thing that, I can just say what to link these two ideas. So this is not a question because what to do you want would be the question. This is just what to link two ideas, two clauses. So what it is a question, right? I could also say that is what I want. Okay, in both of these cases, the what part is not being used to form a question, because that would be what do you want. Um, so in both of these cases, the what is not stressed, because it's not stressed when it, it just links. Um, it's only stressed when it's actually a question, like what do you want? Um, and so in that case, it would definitely be um, the, the true schwa, right? Is that what you want? Is that what, what, what? Is that what you want? Is that what you want? Um, that's what I want. That's what, what, that's what I want, what I want. Now, if I say it more clearly, if I say, you know, like, like, is that what you want? Is that what, what, what you want? I can go more into that upside down V because I'm slowing it down. I'm trying to make it clearer. It's dynamic, okay? Um, so the short answer for the pronunciation of what, it's a schwa. It doesn't matter if it's a true schwa, upside down E IPA symbol, or if it's that upside down V IPA symbol. That depends on how you're speaking, um, how clearly you're saying it and or stressing it. Um forget these other transcriptions that say like wah or something like that. It's, even if those exist, which I mean, they do exist, but you don't have to pronounce them that way. It just makes it more confusing for you. Completely ignore it, okay? Um, my job is to make this simpler for you, <laughs> even though sometimes it might not seem to be the case. <laughs> uh, Leon, hello, welcome. Yes, welcome, Leon. Or Lion, Lion, I don't know if it's supposed to be Le Lion. I see Bastav, so I don't know if it's Leon, because that would be the pronunciation of the name. Usually in English, we would spell it this way. So I don't know if you want me to pronounce Leon or Lion, because that's the spelling of the word Lion in English. But anyway, hello. <laughs> um, 
got some stuff going on, on my phone. Nothing important. Um, so, no questions, guys. Come on. You're supposed to be prepared. Um, when in when in the question, how old are you? The stress is on R. What is the context? Um, okay. So first, let me say so to be. Okay, all verbs, whether they're one syllable or not, because we know if, if a word is more than one syllable, there's going to be stress somewhere in the word. One of the syllables is going to be stressed. Like that's 100% rule. If it's a one syllable verb, all one syllable verbs will be stressed, except for to be. <laughs> um, to be is sometimes stressed, but normally it's not. Okay, why? Let's think about it. There's a logical reason why. All other verbs are actions. They describe some action we're doing. Eat, go, sleep, walk. Okay. Um, but to be is just an equal sign. That's all it is. It just says this equals that. Right? And then we can add the ing to say this equals doing that. <laughs> right? Um, so because of that, to be is not really stressed. So if I say I am tall, normally we say I'm, we contract it, so it's definitely not stressed, right? But even if I uncontract it, unless I give it stress for a special reason, I just say I am tall. I am tall. Tall is the stress there. I am tall. Okay. Um, one case where to be does commonly become stressed is in how are you? Okay. Um, why? because that's the purpose of the sentence. I'm asking, what is your current state of being? Are you in a positive state? Are you in a negative state? Are you healthy? Are you not healthy, right? It's this general question about like how you are, how is your existence at this moment? Um, or, or you know, how, how has your existence been going recently? Um, so it gets that emphasis. It, it becomes natural to give it that stress because now it's kind of like it's, um, it's actual content I'm asking about your, your being. So how are you? How are you? Um, now you might take that and say, okay, well, if I ask someone, are you tall? I'm asking about their being. Don't extrapolate it like that. It's, that's just the, the way that I explain that in this case. <laughs> um, it doesn't apply to all cases. Um, just to kind of help you understand why sometimes it might be the, the focus of the sentence. Um, if I say, are you tall? The focus of that is I'm trying to find out if you're tall or not. It's not on to be, where here the focus is literally on your existence itself. So um, we would say, how are you? How are you? And if I say good, the return to that would actually be stress on you usually. How are you? Now we'll contract our how are, how are you? Good, how are you? Right now if I say, how are you? Good, how are you? Now it just sounds like I'm, I'm mimicking the person. I'm, it, it doesn't fit. So we switch the emphasis to you on the reply, right? Oh, I'm good, how are you, right? Because um, now it switches. Your question, so that's some background there about how stress with to be works. Um, your question, right, so what would the context be if I say, how old are you, okay? And this would also usually have a certain intonation, like how old are you? Okay, notice I even like, I didn't even link old and R, I sort of separated it out. I really made R like its own little thing. I did flow into you, but I didn't connect the D um, and I didn't contract it like how older, okay? If I say this sentence normally with no special context, I just wanna know your age. I would say, how old are you? How older, how older? And so we're gonna flap the D into um, er, the contracted er instead of R, how old are you? Or I can say, how old are you? But probably we're not gonna say R, we're gonna say er. Um, that's no special uh, emphasis. The focus is on old, because I want to know your age. How old are you? How old are you, right? But let's say um, two cases I can think of off the top of my head. One that you might encounter in real life, one that you probably wouldn't. <laughs> um, the one that you probably wouldn't encounter in real life is imagine if you're reading like a fantasy story, right? Or like a sci-fi story or something like that, where there's somebody who's like really, really, really old, but they look young. Maybe they're a vampire or something. I don't know. Um, and you know, uh, the person says something like, uh, oh yeah, you know, I was, I was, I, I fought in the, um, you know, the war of 1812, which is a war we had here in the United States. I fought in the war of 1812. And it's like, what? Like, how old are you? <laughs> right. Um, so I'm putting it on R like, like, cause now the, 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 
the shift of emphasis is more on their being. Like, like how could you possibly be that old? Like, how old are you, right? What, what is this equal sign, right? We're emphasizing the equal sign. What does your age equal? It, do, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, how could you be that old, right? So when we emphasize that equal sign, just like in how are you, um, that gets the focus, right? Because of the context. A context that you might find probably in real life would be uh, if somebody is acting very immature, right? Like, like a child, say they're like, you know, 25, but they're, you know, I don't know. Uh, they're, they're whining about something and, and, you know, throwing things, you know, like, like a child would. Right. And you say like, dude, like, how old are you? It's like, basically you're, you're implying like, Hey, you're older than this. Why are you acting like you're this old? You should, we say, act your age, meaning act like you're 25 because you are 25. Um, so that's a case where, again, you might emphasize that equal sign, um, the R part, because you're implying, hey, your age equals this, not this. So why are you acting this? This way you should act, you know, like this, uh, this equal sign. So you can see, I hope, how when you need to emphasize that equal sign, okay, which that can get you into trouble if you try to extrapolate that too much. But that's that's the basic idea. If, if you need to emphasize that equal sign because of a specific context or because of say like, how are you? It should make logical sense why we're giving to be the stress and the focus because that's what the sentence is about, um, whether that's based on a particular context or not. Um, and yes, there's a cat here. This is her spot now. Um, so let me know if that doesn't make sense, if you have follow-up questions. Um, I know it can be kind of abstract, but hopefully that does make sense. Um, what is your British English RP appreciation perception? Uh, have you 100% clear understanding of all grammar and common words? Is the same language just with attractive, fancy, weird, tiresome accent, any anxiety, dark zones? Uh, okay, so, well, <laughs> so when you say, have you 100% clear understanding? That's British right there. Because <laughs> Americans would never say that. Uh, we would say if, if have is the main verb, we never use it by itself to form the question. Um, maybe if we want to sound really fancy or old timey, like it, it could happen. Um, but we we always say, do you have? Do you have a 100% clear understanding of all grammar and common words? So that right there sounds British. Um, that makes me think that you've had some British influence or, or whatever. Um, so what is my perception of British English? Uh, me personally, um, I mean, I like British English. I like how it sounds. There's actually a wide array of, of accents in the UK. Um, if we're looking at RP specifically, um, yeah, it's cool. Um, I can try to do a British accent, but it's like if I actually go to Britain, they'll be like, yeah, no, you're, you're, you're not, not good at that. <laughs> um, but all Americans, well, maybe not all Americans, but most Americans can at least mock a British accent. Um, because to us, uh, which again, there, there's, there's a range of perceptions, um, and it kind of depends on the context and like how we're playing with the language, but there's this probably because of our history, like with the American revolution and everything, how we, you know, back in the day got our independence from Britain and stuff like we're, you know, we're allies with Britain and stuff and they're cool. You know, I don't, we, usually we, we don't generally have any actual real problems with them, but, um, some people look at RP as like, you know, very attractive, um, some people uh, think that it can sound very arrogant, um, which again, this probably goes back through our history. <laughs> um, so if if uh, like if I if I'm joking with my friend, right, and um, I want to sort of play with the language, right, I could say like um, uh, say I, I I want a, a glass of water. Right? I'm thirsty. I say, go get me a glass of water, slave. You know, something like that. Just like playing with my with my friend. We like to joke around like that. Um, and so we'll use that British accent to sound more arrogant and more, you know, superior and like, oh, I have the right to to command you and call you a slave because I'm using this British accent. Again, all just a joke. Um, so it has that sort of feeling to it. Um, and I've mentioned this before on the live streams. If you notice, a lot of the bad guys in movies have a British accent. Right. Not all of them, obviously, but a lot of them in, in a lot of really big movies, like I think in, in Die Hard, um, which obviously is a big classic movie. Um, 
they'll you'll you'll commonly hear that the bad guy has a British accent, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> there's a there's sort of this perception in in the subconscious of of uh, American culture that you know oh the bad guy he's going to be smart and sophisticated and arrogant and you know all this stuff and so it's just stereotypes we don't actually think of British people that way but it's sort of in the background of our our culture um, for fun you know. <laughs> Uh, anxiety, I wouldn't say so. Dark zones, um, I'm not sure what dark zones mean, like like any like really negative connotations or something, I don't know. Um, uh, I will say, which I don't even know if I can say this because of YouTube monetization, but like bloody, right? Which in British English is like, <gasps> right? It's it's <laughs> sort of kind of like, like, I guess like the F word sort of. Um, but to me, like, I don't feel anything. <laughs> so like I could say it 10 times and it's just like, it's literally like if I, if I, you know, had a cut on my arm and my arm was bloody, right? Like, okay, that's just a description that there's lots of blood. <laughs> so that, that's all it means to me. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I have a friend who likes to use that, um, that term, uh, but, and he's American. He just, he likes to use it. Uh, so anyway, um, do I have a clear understanding of all the grammar and common words? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, there's certain things that sound British. I mean, I'm not an expert on on British English or, or RP specifically, but there are certain things that they'll do, like with certain uses of the present perfect or with certain uses of how they, they use have uh, in the structure of grammar that um, will sound British to us. Um, but that's not my focus. I don't really care. Uh, most of the words we share, obviously there's lots of different words as well, but it's it's basically the same language. Um, we can understand each other. It's, we would say mutually intelligible. That's the technical term. So um, yeah, especially if it's RP, we don't really have any problems understanding RP. Now, if you're gonna talk about somebody who has a different British accent, um, then we might have some difficulties understanding. Some of them are a little harder to understand, but for RP, very standard to us. Yeah. Um, I was watching some random YouTuber and she said the phrase, it's a big deal though. With a dental TH, it sounded like. <laughs> okay. Please tell me it's not just me. <laughs> okay. So I understand why it can sound like that to you, but that is not the way she pronounced it. <laughs> because if we say that word, which I'm not going to say the whole word, but if we say that word, that second D, um, it's a weak D because the stress is on the first syllable, but it would be do, like a nice, clear, regular English D. It would not be dental in any way. Um, it's not, uh, you could maybe flap it possibly. Um, again, the, the half L, vowel sound, um, the dark L. Um, I, I call it a vowel because it mostly acts like a vowel. This is one case where sometimes it doesn't quite work. It doesn't always trigger the flap, um, but you could technically flap here if you're speaking a little faster. Um, but either way, that, that D is a D, whether it's a flap D or a normal D, it's not a, a dental replacement, okay? Um, now, deal um, can reduce to dill, right, with an A instead of an E, but if we have though after it, it's going to be, um, it's a big deal though, deal though, though, though. That does not to our ears sound anything like that word that, that you heard. They're completely different. We would not even interpret it as, as that word. Um, so it could just be your ears are a little off. Um, or maybe for whatever reason it came out that way when she said it and it was like a little slip of the tongue. I don't know. Maybe that happened, but probably it's your ears are just a little off. Um, Sergio, welcome. Um, do you know if there is a difference between the American pronunciation of the vowel at and the British one? Yes, yes, there is. Um, I can't tell you exactly what it is, um, but if you go on Forvo, forvo.com, forvo.com, not all of the recordings are reliable, but most of them are. Um, you look up a particular sound or a particular word, um, it's a really good resource to get you know, multiple samples of different native speakers, male and female, pronouncing the same sound or same word. Um, I used that uh, for Spanish way back in the day um, when I was making my Anki cards. But uh, if you listen to the British pronunciation of a, it does sound different. 
Um, it has a little bit of a different quality to it that it, it just kind of sounds British. It still sounds like the same sound. That That's the thing. Like it's close enough that I still recognize it as ah, but it's not quite the same ah. It's kind of like how in Hindi, Hindi has eh, but it's, it's farther back. And like when I hear it, I recognize it as eh, but it doesn't sound like the English eh. Um, so it's 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 a little bit of a, a weird case. Um, there is a very small difference, yes. Uh, I have a question related to prepositions. Um, okay, so I'm gonna come back to you, Gabriel, here in a second. I'm gonna follow this thread. Just like in your book, you talk about logical prepositions. Is there any logic when it is used in a compound manner, such as in cases with where, where, and whereby, whereas, et cetera? Thank you. Uh, first time in your YouTube. Okay, well, welcome. Uh, Leon. I still don't know if it's Leon or Lion. Uh, <laughs> um, but yes, thank you. Uh, maybe I just call you L. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I've gotten several questions from several people about like, oh, you know, can I apply logic to this? Can I apply logic to that? Generally, yes. Um, I think some things it, it's it's not necessary. Like it just makes things overly complicated. Um, with the prepositions, the reason why, and, and again, remember with the prepositions, it's called the logic of prepositions, but um, the, the core focus is to build the feeling. We're using a logical approach. Because um, remember, sometimes general logic, like you'll say, oh, well, it's, it's logical to put this preposition and yet English doesn't do it. We use this other preposition that's also logical. And there's a reason for that. Um, uh, so general logic doesn't always work, but you can use a logical approach to find sort of that, that core idea of the preposition and then build the feeling for that, that core idea um, that, that will then help you get the language uh, on a deeper level and a lot faster than if you, you know, just did the traditional route. Um, and that's because there are many prepositions. They're super small little, you know, function words that, that connect things. Um, and between languages, obviously, you know, there, there's not always a one-to-one -one translation. Like Spanish has en, which could be in or on. Um, but if you say estoy en la playa, right, that literally would translate as maybe I'm in the beach or I'm on the beach, but we say I'm at the beach. If you say on or in, those have, those, those work, but they have specific meanings. Where if you want to say your location, we say at, we don't even say in or on. So between languages, obviously it's a big problem. And so this this helps with that as well because there's just lots of little prepositions. Um, so this type of approach is very, very useful. Um, there are other parts of the language that I think this type of approach can work like verbs. I'm gonna be writing a, a book about verbs at some point in the future using the exact same approach, looking at probably like the top 10 to 15 most common verbs. Um, Things like this, what you're asking, so like where combination. So we have where and where by whereas. Um, yes, uh, I haven't specifically thought about this topic, but off the top of my head, I would say yes, because where has, has a particular feeling, right? When we say where, we're talking about, I mean, it can be used in ways where it's not actually a lo location. Like I said, we, it can be used in ways where it's not actually a location. That use of where would, would is replacing in which. We can use it in cases in which it's not an actual location. Um, where is sort of replacing in which in, in speech, where in writing, we tend to still use in which, especially formal writing. That's a whole different topic, but um, by default, right, the, the core normal meaning of where is talking about a location. And so as soon as I say where, it feels like, okay, location, right? What, 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 what place are we talking about? Where if I say when, now it feels like time, right? Because that's what those words are associated with. Um, and so those are relatively easy. They're, they're mostly self-explanatory, I think, um, aside from you know, the other little ways that we might be able to use them. Um, that's not too complicated. And then if you combine that with the logic of prepositions, so wherein, whereby, whereas, um, you can start to see, obviously, like here, where isn't necessarily about a physical location. Um, and by the way, these combinations with where are very formal sounding, <laughs> usually. Um, but let's see. So if we go where in, okay. So we have two definitions. One is a conjunction, meaning in what or in which. One is an adverb, meaning in what way or respect. So we know in is a container, okay. And if we say in what, 
or in which as a conjunction. So um, I don't even know how it uses in a sentence. Like it's it's not even part of normal speech really. <laughs> um, it sounds so fancy. But anyway, you, you could probably uh, find a way to like, you look at the definitions and you say, okay, so I know in is a container where is like a location, which could be like an abstract location, doesn't have to be a physical location. And you can think, okay, how do these two work to create these meanings? Right. Um, so you could still apply that that same approach. Um, and then by obviously has a different logic. So now we're combining where and by. It's just like a phrasal verb. Like if we say, um, you know, uh, I can't even think on the spot, uh, to to go over your notes, right? Meaning to review your notes as go over or um, to uh, go under, like a, a company fails, the company went under, right? So go over, go under over and under are opposites. And yet, obviously, we're talking about two completely different things that aren't even related. Um, they're not actually opposites in their, their surface meaning. And so you can see go combined with a different preposition will give you a different thing where if you combine where in, where by, whereas, some of them might be the same, um, or they might overlap, but we're getting we're combining two things just like with a phrasal verb in order to get a specific meaning. So it's, it's basically functioning the same. Um, Gabriel, I have a question about the word closure. The dictionary doesn't give me the right meaning to the context I'm looking for. If I say I need more closure, does it mean I need more background info? No, not at all. Um, closure is where there's some sort of negative emotional event, um, like, I don't know, somebody died or whatever, and there's like something like that you, you say that person knew something, and now that they're dead, you know, like you'll never know. Um, and then, so like you, you'll say, I'll never get closure. Like I'll never be able to, to close that, that little thing, you know, of knowing that piece of information because this person is gone and he's the only person who, who knew that information. Um, so it's literally like closing some topic so that you feel like, oh, okay, I feel like relieved. You're not, you know, still caught in that, uh, I guess you could say. Um, we have a related phrase, which is to tie up loose ends, which isn't used exactly the same as closure, but under the surface, they have a, a similar root. Um, so, uh, yeah, what you would probably be looking for, if you say I need more background info, uh, I need more context, um, I need more closure, I need more, I don't know, context is what comes to my mind because the context would be like the background info. Um, so no, closure isn't used that way. Um, the accent is not more than the cover of books. The important is inside. I don't know what that means. Um, if you can maybe rephrase that. Um, Accent is not more than the cover of books you're is inside. I mean, I guess maybe you're saying something like don't judge a book by its cover, which is a phrase we have. I don't know why you're talking about accent, though. Um, maybe because I was talking about received pronunciation. I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, Gabriel, I remember that in the last slide, a guy was spamming the comments, and he ominously threatened the poor guy by saying, I will kick you. <laughs> Even though you're a great practitioner of jujitsu, why does everybody make that mistake? It's not jujitsu. It's not jujitsu. It's judo. There are two different things. <laughs> judo. It even says right there on the shirt that's hanging on my wall: judo dojo, judo, judo, judo. I don't know jujitsu. Um, obviously, there's similarities between the two. Jujitsu is more about taking somebody down. Uh, which I mean, you don't necessarily have to take them down. You can wrap around them and you know submit them in the air. But jujitsu seems to be more about submitting people, um, whether that's on the ground or not. Where judo, judo does have a ground game. We would say, like if you go to the ground, there's certain things that you can do to submit them. Um, but judo is all about throwing people. I don't know if jujitsu has any throws. Maybe it does, but judo is literally whether you're throwing them here, you're throwing them from the hip, you're using your legs to sweep them. It's all about throwing the person. You're using their own gravity against them to make them fall and hit the floor. 
while you're still standing. Um, Jiu-Jitsu seems to be much more like close grappling, hold on type thing, uh, where Judo is more like you're just redirecting their force and you're not trying to hold on to them. You're just letting them you know, go with, with the fall. You just throw them somewhere. Two different things. Anyway, that aside, <laughs> Kind of bugs me because everybody says that. Like everybody I tell it to, they're always like, "Oh yeah, you do jujitsu." I'm like, "No, it's not jujitsu. Why does everything is jujitsu?" Um, I guess jujitsu is more more recognized. It's more like popular uh, of a of a term, um, and so people confuse it because it sounds similar. But anyway, um, yeah. But I get your joke. Yes, kick you, and then jujitsu or judo is there's there's no kicks or punches. Yeah, <laughs> good job funny. <laughs> it's a good pun. Um, I do appreciate that. <laughs> um, but yes, anyway, uh, what's the most neutral way to ask someone what ranking they are in jujitsu? Again, judo. Um, I don't know anything about jujitsu. Uh, in Portuguese, I just asked the color of the person's belt. So, well, in martial arts in general, uh, at least from like an English speaker's perspective or specifically an American perspective, because I guess I can't speak for everybody, um, we we do uh, look at the, the belt color. Um, so in judo, I'm a green belt, uh, which I'm also very rusty, but I'm a green belt. Um, and for adults in judo, um, it goes from white to green. Um, if you're not an adult, you go through like yellow and orange and blue and all these other things, but, and then you get to green. So adults go white to green, um, and then brown and then black. Uh, so technically there is a number system um especially once we get to black because once you get to black there's more right like black in th this is i think a, a very asian thing because you find it in a lot of like um, traditional games like go um, if you don't know what that is it doesn't matter um, but you also find this in martial arts where it's like black belt is where you're finally born that's where you start most people look at black belt as like the end no black belt is where you start before black belt you're just learning the basics of like how to do this thing and getting good enough at it to where you can say, I can do this thing. <laughs> where once you hit black belt, um, that's first rank black belt, which in Japanese would be um, uh, ikkyo, I think. Um, so like literally like first student or like first level student. Um, and then you go up to second degree black belt, third degree black belt, fourth degree black belt. Uh, or no, no, black belt would be showdown. Yeah, that's right, because the cues are for, for below that. Yeah, so Shodan, Nidan, Sandan, so one, two, three, et cetera, and all the way up to, I think, in Judo, it goes up to, like, ninth or something. Um, and anyway, yeah, so technically there's a numbering system, but unless you're black, we don't really care about that. We just say, like, once you're black, we'll say, like, third degree black belt. So it's, like, black, third level, yeah. Uh, yep, I got it. Actually, I was talking with one of my speaking partners about it, and I didn't catch it at all because she just gave me the first example, but now I did things. Um, I don't even remember what that question was for. <laughs> I remember answering your question, but I don't remember what the question was. Um, oh, yeah, how are you? Got it. Or how old are you? Um, so, yeah, and also I should mention, like, there are, there are maybe other contexts. Those are just the contexts I thought of, so... Um, you know, if, if your speaking partner said, like, how old are you? That doesn't necessarily mean she was saying you're being immature. It's just, you know, whatever the context was. Um, those are just examples. But uh, what is the difference between don't touch her and don't you touch her? Context, there was a man yelling at an officer. Those are exactly the same. They're interchangeable. Um, so usually the, the, the default, uh, when we're using a command, so this would be a negative command, because um, the command would be touch but this is don't touch, right? So it's negative. Um, and it should just be don't verb, right? Um, if you add you, it sounds maybe a little bit more direct, a little bit more informal in a way, um, especially in a context like this, it, it, it might come out more if it's, um, if the person is really angry about it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just, it's a, a thing that we can do um, and it's, it's fine. Um, it just adds, adds to it kind of, but they mean the same thing. Yeah. Um, but to be clear, I just see this now. So it wouldn't be, don't you touch her? That doesn't make any sense. Because that would be touch her, like T O U C H E R, would be someone who touches. So, like, okay, I touched my hand, so I may touch her of my hand, right? Whatever. Um, so, 
uh, remember, touch and her, unless we emphasize that H and we, we push out that H and her, it's going to sound like toucher. So it's going to sound just like the noun of someone who touches. Um, so I just want to make that clear because what you have written here doesn't make any sense. That if it's don't you touch her, um, then it's the same thing. Okay, that aside, uh, on breathing through your words in English, make sure I didn't miss anything. Yeah, okay. Uh, I find that as soon as I'm no longer conscious of my breath, I revert to my old way of speaking. Any exercise to help with that? Good question. Um, yeah. So, especially if you have fossilization, like if you know you're already an intermediate to advanced speaker and you're trying to change your accent, um, it makes it extra difficult. Which is one reason why I hate the fact that schools don't emphasize pronunciation because they're just kind of setting you guys up for failure. But anyway, that aside. Um, whether it's the you know the produ production of sounds, the rhythm, uh, whatever it is, um, and especially if you're more advanced and have fossils, there's always going to be a an element of conscious, deliberate practice, um, as well as playing with it to kind of get used to it. And so it's something that you kind of just have to keep an eye on and always just keep playing with to like reinforce, reinforce, reinforce. Um, some sit down practice time. Uh, is useful, but much more important than that is generally just trying to remember and be aware and practice like throughout the day without actually sitting down and studying. Um, just to like remind yourself, oh yeah, I need to you know breathe through, and you just practice saying things, you know, breathing through more, whatever it is. Um, and it's just that ongoing playing with it that is going to help bridge the gap from your knowledge into your your normal unconscious ability. Um, but. Uh, some of the most more recent lessons, like this breathing through English thing, um, I am going to make follow-up practice lessons for them. But right now, I'm kind of trying to get just like the main lesson that introduces the topic and you know tells you about it, blah blah blah. Um, and then I'm going to go back and do the the practice lessons for for some of these things. So um, I will have some exercises coming at some point. But for now, just be aware of it, play with it, you know. Um, because the stuff I would give you is, is just stuff that you can focus on to sit down and practice with it. But again, you can be doing that throughout the day. Just just play with it. Um, and again, make sure you're not breathing too much. Okay, there, there's a, a, a I don't want to say delicate, but there's a, definitely a balance, okay, where you can start sounding too breathy. Um, and it's it's really, it's it's pretty subtle, actually. Um, it only takes a little bit of extra breath, except on the, the strong version of the stop sounds. That's where we do have, again, not too much, but we do have a bit more force there. Um, but aside from the strong version of the stop sounds, it's really just like if your language doesn't really use a whole lot of breath, um, then it's literally just like a tiny little extra bit of breath. So you have to make sure you don't overdo it. Um, and I will say uh, for Spanish speakers, this might also apply to Portuguese. I don't know because Portuguese is a little bit different in some ways. Um, but I, I was working, uh, talking to a Spanish student the other day, and we discovered that Spanish doesn't breathe through as much as English, um, which is something that I was never aware of. And we were talking about, we were comparing directly, I want to go to the beach versus, uh, no, it wasn't I want to go to the beach. It was um, I went to the store and bought a new computer uh, versus uh, fui a la tienda y compré una nueva computadora. And um, what I did, so right, I, I said the English, and then I had him say the Spanish, and I was listening very closely. I had him say the English, I had him say the Spanish, and I noticed that he was using the same amount of breath in both. Um, and when I listened to the Spanish, I was like, that sounds like good Spanish. But then he used the same breath in English, and I was like, no, that, it's, it's, it doesn't quite sound right. Um, and then I had him use more breath in English, and it sounded really good. And I had him use more breath in Spanish. And even he said, like, that's a little bit weird. Um, and so even between Spanish and English, which are relatively quite similar, um, Spanish is, is a category one language for, for English speakers and vice versa. Um, you know, it's not like Japanese to English or something. Uh, this breath component can add to how natural you sound. Um, and so it kind of just depends on your language. Um, maybe you breathe as much, maybe not, I don't know. Um, but you got to find that exact balance. Um, okay, anyway, uh, A, you are welcome. Uh, Shun Shun, hello, how are you? I am pretty good, how are you? 
Um, welcome back to the live. Um, David, can I pronounce the words ending in L with LL? Easier for me to think of the next word. Yeah, so um, so you asked this question earlier, and wait, was this the, the question? Can I pronounce words ending in L with the full? Okay, so this isn't quite the same question. Um, can you? Yes. Um, technically, the half L is sort of like a lazier L, um, the, the dark L. And so technically, anytime there's an L, regardless of where it is, the fully enunciated version is that light L, or what I call the full L consonant. Um, and you could do that. But I, if you want to sound completely natural, like if you're trying to like pass as a native, if that's your goal, don't do that. Because in fact, we usually do the opposite. We tend to ignore the rule of when to use the full L, and we will more often than not just use the half L. Um, so you would sound more natural going the other way and just using the, the half L or the dark L all the time. Um, and it's not necessarily all the time, all the time. Usually if L is the first sound in, in a sentence, it's it's we don't necessarily have to use the full L, but it's much, much more likely in that case that we're gonna use the full L because it's that very first sound. Um, so you could, um, but your L's are going to probably start to stand out to whoever's listening to you as you speak more. And they're going to probably, like, if everything else is perfect, but you just, like, always use the full L, people are going to wonder, like, why are you always enunciating your L's? Like, it's it's going to stand out and be kind of weird. Um, but if your goal isn't to, you know, pass perfectly as a native and you just want to make it easier on yourself, yeah, go ahead. There's no problem with it. Um, sorry for bothering. How do you pronounce poor, which is about sound? So it's, it's, uh, in the way I speak and teach, which is easier, it's an R-colored O, okay? Which, by the way, in American English, this word and this word are pronounced the same. I think some Americans might pronounce them different, but most of us don't. In British English, it's like poor and poor or something like that. Uh, but in American English, they're, it's, they're the same. So it's just or with a P, or, or. Um, if you don't have the cot-cot merger, then how do they say that? Par. I think they use that the R colored backwards C. So it'd be like par, par, kind of like that. Um, but again, I don't speak that way. I don't teach that way. I don't recommend that. Um, you could do it that way if you want, if you don't want to use the merger, but the merger is the easier way and it would just be an R colored O. Uh, Einstein's, is it, you'd better buy it or you better buy, oh, good question. Einstein's always has such good questions, yes. Uh, is the first one for well-educated people and the second one for the rest of us? <laughs> Just kidding, but still, which one should we use and when? Very, very good question. And I like your follow-up to that, like your assumption of like, oh, maybe it's like a more informal version or it sounds less educated. Um, yeah, that tells me a lot about your level of English. Um, very good job. So what it's supposed to be is you'd better, which is a contraction for those of you who don't know, because a lot of English learners don't know this. Um, this is sort of like a more advanced, obscure, random thing that a lot of learners don't tend to hear about until maybe they're really advanced. Um, this is you had better buy it. Uh, and we can contract you had to you'd, um, or it doesn't matter if it's I or you or he, we can contract, it's always had, right? He had better buy it. Um, it's never have or has or whatever. Um, unless maybe you say, you, wait, you'd, you, if you say you have better, you've better have bought in it. I don't think that's even proper grammar, but if you want to use the present perfect with it, then you could do that. Like you've better have bought in it. <laughs> anyway, that doesn't matter. That's super complex. Um, the basics here, you had better buy it or you better buy it. So it is very, very common to just completely drop that had altogether, because usually we contract it, you just drop it, you better buy it. Um, it does sound maybe a bit more informal. Um, does it sound a little less educated? Yeah, maybe a bit, um, but I think it's pretty standard. It just, you know, could be a little more informal. Um, and kind of whichever one comes out is whichever one we use. You'd better buy it, you better buy it. It's kind of easier just to like ignore that D. Um, but also, right, part of the reason why that happens is because of a linking rule, right? So if we're going from a D to a B, we can shift. And so it would actually be like it's two Bs, like you better. 
but we're not going to push out that second or that first B, right? Because that's not how it works. We're going to be like, you better, you better. Uh, and because of that, especially if you're speaking quickly, when you shift, you actually don't have to do that first one. And you could just drop it all together. You better, you better buy it. So that's probably why that developed. Um, and it doesn't really matter all that much anyway. So um, if you want to be safe, make sure the D is there. You can stop it. You don't have to say you'd better. That sounds a little too enunciated. You'd better. You'd stop the D and then do the B. That's fine. Um, but if you use the other one, I, I don't think it's going to be a problem. Um, and I mean, if you're in a for more formal situation and you tell somebody this, like, it's kind of weird in a formal situation anyway, because you're you're sort of like the the purpose of the sentence is like if you don't buy it, there will be a negative consequence. Like I'm you know, I'm 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 gonna hurt you or something. It doesn't have to be physical, but you know, it's like if you don't buy it, something bad's gonna happen, right? Um, and so you probably wouldn't use that in a formal situation anyway. Um, like maybe if you know, I don't know, it, it's. It just doesn't seem to fit the, the context of a formal situation anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Um, I'm struggling with the rhythm, and I have, I have two. Can you give any tips to overcome it? You can check the context out in the video above. The, it doesn't show me video links. If you try to post a video link, YouTube will not send it. So you you have to give me the title uh, and the timestamp so I can look it up myself. Um, if it's T O O, there should be a comma. I have too, meaning that would be present perfect. Like I have done it too, or I have seen it too. Um, so just want to make sure that you're not misspelling too, because it could be I have two, meaning two of something. That would be a different intonation pattern, different rhythm. Um, and then of course there's I have to with one O, which would be have to do something. Um, that would also be different. So give me the link and the. Uh, or not the link, the, the title, and, oh, I'm glad YouTube caught that one. Um, except it didn't catch all the other ones. Okay, sorry for this, guys. Let me kick this guy really quick. Report, report, okay, report. Man, some of y'all are just like, ridiculous. I don't know how people do this. I mean, I like that I have trolls because I mean that that's usually a sign of uh, of um, you know, I'm getting more attention so people are randomly coming in and posting stuff, but I mean, that's just that's a little too much. Like wow. All right, moving on. Um, anybody who saw that, I apologize. I didn't catch that sooner. <laughs> um, but he is gone. I reported him. Hopefully he is uh, banned. Um, I'm not completely sure how all those controls work, but here we are. Uh, OK, so I'm struggling with the OK, blah, blah, blah. Uh, can you check it out real quick and tell me if you notice anything that kind of stands out or that's a little bit off about her accent? Again, I don't get links, um, so I didn't see any link that you posted. Uh, she's never been to the US, by the way, so yeah. Uh, can I say writing, hiding, finding, et cetera, with a stop D? Well, you don't have to change in to in. Um, but uh, see if I say, well, hold on. If I say write, write, writing, writing, and it's going to be a flap. Right, right. Yeah, okay, so yeah, if, if you change in to in, um, that the informal version, right? Because um, when we use a regular N, uh, actually, hold on, writing, writing, yeah. So for me, right, because the way that I say the, the added ING is E plus N instead of E plus N, um, and that will still sound like ING. Um, but if I do E plus N, then it sounds like this more informal pronunciation, uh, which is what all speakers do, regardless of how they do the the ing uh, added to a verb. Uh, so, and we would write that with with a, a comma. Just obviously, you know that, but for people who don't know that, that's what's happening. Um, so, this is a more more informal, like oh, I'm I'm riding a horse, you know, or something, or something. Um, can you use a stop d in that case? You can do that just like garden. 
mountain mountain has a, a t garden has a d it's the same type of thing um or like we we're talking about earlier with didn't right Riden, hiding fighting now finding doesn't work find finding finding it doesn't work because of the n we're gonna say finding 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 there's gonna be a little d there um but yeah riding hiding um sliding uh, same thing, Biden, Joe Biden, right? It's, it's all spelling is a little different, but it's you can all pronounce that the same. Um, or you can still flap it, right? And hide in, uh, again, the, the D and find doesn't flap because uh, the N, um, it would just be a weak D. Uh, thank you for explaining. Uh, I find the most confusing when to use whereas. Uh, my advice would just be don't use it because <laughs> you're going to just sound super, super formal. Um, can you explain different ways to use as a conjunction and preposition? It was very confusing. I would I would ignore it. I would completely ignore it. Um, as is sometimes because as is sometimes while as we come to the station, the train left. Um, okay, I, I'm not sure what you're saying here. Like as is conjunction, as is preposition, as is very confusing. Like, I'm confused at what, like, are, are these different questions or, I don't know, this, it's just, I'm not sure what you're, you're asking there. Um, the last one, like, as we came to the, the station, the train left, I mean, that would be about as. Oh, I see, as is a conjunction. So if you put parentheses around as, and then you say is a conjunction, as is also a preposition, as is very confusing. So you're talking about the word as, that makes more sense. Um, as sometimes mean, or you can say is, but as again in quotations is sometimes because in quotations, or sometimes means because, sometimes while. So okay, so basically the logic of as that's what you're asking about. Um, I didn't include as in the book because it's um, it didn't seem like as as big of a uh, an issue to me. Um, apparently, I was wrong because I've gotten some questions about that. Um, plus I had 17 prepositions and by the time I was done with the book, I was like, I'm done with this. <laughs> no more. <laughs> um, I tried to talk a bit about as last time. Uh, I think it was last time or time before that. It doesn't matter. The first thing I'll say, it doesn't matter what, what type of grammatical thing it is. Cause I, I, I say the logic of prepositions, um, but some of these prepositions can be used in what are technically other grammatical terms, like as a conjunction or something. Um, and it doesn't matter how it's used grammatically, the same underlying uh, feeling will apply. Um, and that's actually why it can be used as a preposition or as a conjunction or whatever. It's, it doesn't matter, it's just different surface usages uh, with the same core. Um, so it's this, the same idea applies whether all uses are a preposition or you have preposition, conjunction, whatever. Um, it works the same way. Uh, under the surface. Uh, as for the surface meanings, that just depends on the exact context. So as to me, um, the, the key word or idea that I would give to it is being, right? As means being, um, which is kind of confusing because is is an equal sign, right? It's kind of talking about being. Um, but it, it depends on the context. So um, if we say as we came to the station. So while right, during, while we are in the process of coming to the station, okay? That's what that means. So that's another way to say the same sentence. Uh, while we were coming to the station, as we came to the station, or as we were coming, you can say that too, um, the train left. So that just means um, we're using as to say, okay, one thing is happening, Okay, even though we're not using the ing form here, as we came, it doesn't matter. The as implies that that action is happening while another action is happening. Okay, so the as tells us we came to the station, the train left, both are happening at the same time because of as. Okay, um, so again, you can think of it as like being, something is happening, two actions are happening at the same time. They're both in existence at the same time, right? Um, if I say uh, I work as a teacher, it's the same thing as saying like I am a teacher, right? So to be and as can have some some uh, sort of overlap or, or under the surface connections going on. But I work as a teacher. That just means okay, my the thing that I do for work, my my work existence, right? What 
my uh, my profession, whatever it is, right, um, is a teacher. This all gets very abstract. As is a, as a pretty abstract proposition, like by by is probably the worst one, uh, but as is pretty abstract too. And so you kind of really have to think like, okay, if the key idea is being, how can I sort of say, okay, as in this case, how does that sort of match being the, this idea of being in some abstract way? Um, but uh, yeah, um, at some point in the future, I don't know when. Um, not going to be anytime soon. I do plan to come up with or come out with a um, uh, a slightly updated version of the logical prepositions, like a, a version two or the second edition, because um, I know there's some typos and stuff in there that I missed that people have mentioned. I need to go through and, and uh, get an editor. I never had an editor, couldn't afford one, um, so I need to get an editor to kind of clean all that stuff up um, and. I will probably go in and add as to the book um, since people are asking about it. Um, I may even add that to the end of the preposition course um, that I will resume after I get an editor, as I mentioned before, uh, like a video editor. Um, so it'll come. Um, but for now, I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Just. Uh, what I would do is I would take this being idea as the core and try to apply that. That's that's how you're gonna learn the best. You just look at a dictionary definition and say, okay, how does being apply in this way? And then you can come to me with more questions and be like, okay, so in this case, I think about it like this, does that make sense or blah, blah, blah. And um, instead of me sitting here trying to explain every case, it'd probably be better if you go try to apply that being idea um, and then come back to me. Um, hello, David. Yes, welcome. Um, then we have the person I kicked. Shun Shun says hi. Um, they do good. Um, let's see. I'm sorry for joining y'all halfway through the live today. Looks like Josh is still catching up with all the questions as usual. Yep. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome, Shun Shun. Um, what time is it? Uh, Twelve thirty-seven. I really hate. I already hate Windows 11, guys. I already hate it because I put my taskbar at the top. And in the taskbar settings, it does not let me put it at the top. And so I'm used to looking up here to see what time it is, and I have to look down here, and it's really annoying me. Anyway, um, just, you know, I, I don't know why I continue to use Windows. Um, okay, so it's only been an hour. Wow. Since it and uh may be used interchangeably in unstressed syllables, not all the time, not all the time, very frequently, not all the time. Um, sometimes it has to be uh. Um, can the words affect? Effect and effect end up sounding the same. Yes, they they will usually be pronounced exactly the same. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure if there's another way to say them. <laughs> um, for the E one, I suppose if I wanted to to clarify that it's not the A one, I might say E. Like there there's there's no effect, so it might come out as E if I'm emphasizing. Otherwise, it'd be a. Uh. But the one with the A, like saying like F effect or something like that just sounds weird to me. Maybe some people say it that way, but the A1 would always be a schwa for me. Um, but both of them, like 99% of the time, the E1 is also going to be a schwa. If any misunderstanding in regards to what word was meant were to arise, I'd assume the native speaker would then opt for the enunciated effect. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. That's just what I said. <laughs> um, yes, exactly. Uh, why should you learn rhythm of English 26? Make David his own a moderator. I should. I should make David a moderator. <laughs> um, okay. Why should you learn rhythm of English? The headphones. Oh, tired, 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 tired. Um, 26 seconds. Okay, what was the question? Uh, Starting with what rhythm and I have to. Okay, uh, can you give any tip to check the context of the video? About? Okay, so 26 seconds. 26. Wait, hold on. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, uh, I'm a little confused. Um, so when I look up that video and I go to 26 seconds, um, I don't hear or see anything with I have to. Um, are you sure it's 26 seconds? It's probably forward. Probably, yeah, I think it's going to be in the answer. Okay, I got it. Yeah, it's, it's at 54 seconds. Okay, how many dogs do you have? I have two. She's saying this like, ugh. I hate when teachers teach this way. The, the, re the way that she's speaking, I mean, she's speaking this way for a reason to make it nice and clear for English learners, but nobody would say that. Like, if I say, how many dogs do you have? Nobody would say, I have two. Like, it, if anything, it sounds like you're mocking them, uh, which would be very bad. Um, this, anyway, we'll focus on the rhythm here. So um, the way I would normally say this, like, how many dogs do you have? I have two. Or we just say two, but I have two. I have two. So two gets the stress. Have is also stress, but two gets the focus. Um, I have two. I have two. I have two. Um, you can kind of really minimize the have there. It doesn't have to actually really be that stressed. But um, OK, then she says, I have to, which would be T-O, meaning I have to do something. Okay, and then the third one she says is, I have two. That would be T-O-O. -O. I can tell just based off of the rhythm and intonation. Um, okay, I know what we're talking about. Um, so, I have two. I have to. I need to do something. You don't have to necessarily. If the context is clear, you don't have to say what it is. You can just say, I have to. Um, and then I have um, two. Okay. What's the difference here in how we pronounce these or how the, the rhythm and intonation works? The first one, just very basic, very straightforward. Two is gonna be that really big focus um, that needs to stand out. I have two, I have two, I have two. Right, you can drop the H and have, I have, that's fine. I have two, okay, that's all it is. And we drop at the end, um, it's just a basic statement. Like I have, I have a car, I have two, I have a car. Same thing, it's just very basic. Um, the second case, this one, this have des definitely needs to be stressed, especially if we don't say the verb that you have to do. Um, so have is gonna get the focus here. So if I, you say like, oh, why, uh, why are you going to the store right now? And I say, well, I have to, I have to, I have to. So right off the bat, in the first case, right off the bat, meaning like straight from the beginning, it's a phrase we have right off the bat. Um, I guess I should type that. Um, so the, the very first thing we notice is the, the stress on have is different because in the first case, even if you stress it, um, it's supposed to have stress, but it doesn't have to when it's, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, that's a different topic. <laughs> uh, it, 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 the stress isn't going to be uh, uh, the focus, right? Two is the focus in the first case where I have the obligation to do something. That's the focus in the second case. And so have gets that focus. Um, and so the two um, in the first sentence is stressed because it's a number, it's a content word. So that's gonna, not only does it get the focus, but it's stressed um, where the two in the second case, T-O is just the preposition two, um, which you can even say I have to, you can reduce it to uh, um, at the end, if it's at the end of a sentence where it's maybe a little more common to say the ooh instead of reducing it to uh, but you don't have to. Um, it can sound maybe a little bit more informal if you reduce it at the end like that, but it's not a big deal, it doesn't matter. Um, but it's not stress and it's not the focus. And so not only do we just drop at the end, like in two, we have to go up a lot with the focus and the stress on two in the first one and then drop for the end of the sentence, where in the second case, it's already not stressed. Um, and so it's just kind of like two. It's just like, it just falls down. Like I have to, have to. So it just keeps falling all the way from have to to. Um, I don't know who this is. 
I should probably answer this. Hold on. Hello. Uh, yes, speaking. You're calling from where? Oh, yes. Okay. No. Uh, okay. Um, so, okay. So, so what, 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 I, I don't know. Uh, uh huh. Okay, so well, so I'm coming in at nine and six, or I'm there from nine to six. Uh huh. I see. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, okay, so I'm staying there overnight. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I didn't know if uh, how long it was going to take. Like it was just like a couple hours or something. So. Um, okay. Um, yeah, tomorrow isn't very good. Um, could, could we do it like in a couple weeks? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, technically my primary is, is Faith Chisholm, but um, I see O'Brien, yeah. Okay. Okay. 
me to think of it. Okay. Um, that. Sorry, guys. Important phone call. Um, okay, so that's done. Uh, I know I wasn't speaking that much, unfortunately, but I mean, you got something, right? <laughs> um, okay, so yes, back to have to. Um, so we see first case, second case. Okay, have isn't the, the focus, two is the focus in the first one. Um, we go way up, we drop at the end. Second case, have is the focus, two is unstressed, not the focus. So it just goes from like have to and keeps falling down. Okay, so I have to. I have two. I have two. I have to. I have to. Okay. In the last case, how do we say that? I have two. I have two. There's a different intonation here. So here, have is stressed, just like in the second case. But the two also is stressed because it means also, like in addition. Um, and we do drop at the end again because it's, it's just a regular statement. Um, but there's a, a little bit of a difference between as we go from have to to in the intonation. When we say, uh, which also the, the obviously in have to, we tend to change that V into an F. That's a sound change. We're focused on the rhythm here. But um, in the second sentence, um, it just keeps going, right? There's no change in the intonation. It just goes up on have and then it just keeps falling towards the end. I have to. I have to. Where here it's I have to. I have two. So it's like it goes have two. Okay. Now there's a comma here and we're supposed to go up at the comma. Um, it does sound like to me like there's a little bit of a drop, but um, the comma is probably pulling it up. Like I have, I have what you can also say it slightly different ways. Like you say, I have two, I have two kind of sounds a little more active, a little more engaged. So the exact intonation depends on how you want to say it. And, and this is different things you can do, but the default intonation would be like, I have two. I have two, I have two. So we can almost see that there's like this, I wouldn't necessarily call it a pause, but there's sort of like this little micro break between the two. There's a little shifting in the intonation um, instead of just a flow. Um, like in the first case, I have two, I have two, I have two, I have two. Well, I guess this, I was saying it the same way. Hold on, the first one would be, um, I have two, I have two. The third one, I have two, I have two. First one, I have two, I have two. Third one, I have two, I have two. So they sound almost exactly the same. <laughs> There's just this sort of little thing between have and two that's a little bit different. Um, plus uh, the have is stressed in that last case as well. So yeah, slightly different rhythm uh, or slightly different intonation specifically. Uh, I understand why you, why you have difficulty with that, but that, that's what it would be. So, um, and this is another reason why I tell you guys to like really focus on your ears and really pay very close attention, especially if you're talking about things that are similar like this, because you need to train your ears to be able to first perceive that difference and then train your mouth uh, to be able to, uh, or your, your intonation and your rhythm to be able to produce that depending on which one you want. Um, so that's a good question. Yeah, very good, very good. Um, Okay, where was I? Um, okay, hello, David. What is your sentence? What is your sentence with if your misunderstandings? Very confusing English, right? One. I don't see that. Okay. Um, if any misunderstandings is the start of the sentence, sorry. Oh. Oh, there it is. If any misunderstandings. Yeah, so it should actually be, to be grammatically correct, it should be if there are any misunderstandings. But in this case, sounding a little more informal, you can kind of drop that there are, like if any misunderstandings with regard to, or, or no, never mind, because, okay. <laughs> There's two ways you could do this. Um, you can say, if there are any misunderstandings in regards to what word was meant, comma, blah, 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 blah. 
or instead of saying if there are any, you can say if any misunderstandings in regards to what word was meant were to arise. So it's really if any misunderstandings were to arise, meaning were to happen, right, hypothetically. Um, but we have all this in, in between, right? So it's what kind of understandings? Understandings in regards to what word was meant. So that's all one idea. And if that type of misunderstanding were to arise. So that's how the grammar is working there. Um, now, what I was saying, let's see. Yeah, informally, sort of like a little bit of a shorthand. If you are, if you use the there are version and you drop the word to arise, you can drop there are and say, if any misunderstandings in regards to what word was meant, blah, 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 blah. And that just sounds a little more informal, a little more shorthand, because um, we're dropping there are. It's not completely necessary for the understanding, but it is grammatically correct to have it there if you use that version. Um, if you use word to arise and there is no there are. Anyway, that aside, um, what is the meaning of your question in simple English? Different forms of as. Yeah, I talked about that. Okay. Uh, would I sound uneducated if I use or instead of nor? I neither smoke nor drink. <laughs> it's actually funny because <laughs> it, it would kind of be the opposite in a way, but in, in, in a bad way. Now, some people do use nor. Um, and even I will sometimes use nor. It's, it's kind of a weird thing because I notice sometimes it comes out, but usually we don't use it. Um, nor is, is a word that is disappearing from American English, um, which is one reason why I hate that teachers like teach you guys that as part of the basics. Like there's or and then there's the negative nor. Um, like if you say, I like this nor, or I... I like this nor that, meaning I don't like this or that. That's that's what we, we would usually do. We would make it the verb negative and then use or instead of saying I like this nor that. Um, that sounds dated. Like, I mean, it still makes sense. Some people might still use it sometimes, but it kind of sounds a little fancy. It sounds dated like most people don't speak that way anymore. Um, if you use nor, it's not that you're going to sound uneducated. It's 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 going to sound the opposite. Like you're maybe overly educated, overly. I mean, that's happy to be overly educated. But it's you know, it's like you're you're highly educated, and uh, it can maybe kind of sound to some people as like arrogant. Like because you're so educated, you're like, oh yes, I know how to speak properly. You know, um, I like this, nor that. See, now I'm using that British accent to kind of sound more sophisticated, more arrogant, possibly. Um, and I'm using nor, right? If, if we were to mimic that British accent, we would start using language like that. Like, I like this, nor that. Please bring me another one, you know? Um, so I would just generally avoid nor. You never have to use it. Um, it's it's never required. You can just make the verb negative uh, and it's perfectly fine. It doesn't matter the, if it's formal context, informal context, just don't use nor. <laughs> That's the easy, easy answer there. Don't use nor. Um, could you please show me how to pronounce? Now, if you want to and you use it properly, go ahead. That's fine. But it, that's it's your call. I would recommend just not using it. Could you please show me how to pronounce words ending in THS with a dental D, months, mouse, mouse. Uh, well, it wouldn't be a dental D. Uh, it would be a dental T because the... Um, well, actually, okay, hold on. <laughs> what about words ending in DT is like with? Okay, so, so months, that's a voiceless TH. So it would be a dental T, if anything. Um, moths, that's also a dental T because it's a voiceless TH. Um, mouths could be a voiced TH or a voiceless TH. Both pronunciations exist, it doesn't really matter. So you could replace it maybe with a dental T or a dental T. Remember, the dental T corresponds to um, the voiceless TH, because T is voiceless, T, and the voiceless TH is voiceless. Um, dental D corresponds to the voiced TH, because D is voiced. Um, it's not just like one replacement for all THs. Uh, so in the, in the word months, um, there's several things you can do. You can say months, fully enunciate, months, months. That's the hardest way to do it. Um, very rare that we would do it that way. Um, you can say uh, months, 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 where you do that in here, and it kind of, I guess, is a little bit of a dental T, but usually when we modify N, uh, no, because that's the dental D. Yeah, it's a weird one, but it, it's kind of like a dental T. Um, but we immediately push out into that S, and so it's kind of like you're just doing dental N to S. 
Um, and there's kind of like no tea there anyway, months, 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 and it's fine. Or in this particular case uh, for NTHS, you can do a regular N, completely drop the TH, and just push into the S. Um, and it'll kind of sound like NTS, but the T is an illusion. Anytime you have N plus S, um, or in the spelling NTS, like wants, the T is an illusion. There's no actual T there. Um, so it's just N, it's an S that gets pushed through the N position. Um, and so you can do that. You can do a regular N and just push the S through months, months. So there's three things that you can do. They're fully enunciated, uh, dental N or normal N, just push the N S through either way. Three ways to say the same word, whichever one comes out, it does not matter, but the fully enunciated one is very unlikely. Um, for moths, okay, so now we don't have an N anymore. So this is gonna change the game a little bit. Moths, fully enunciated, we have a thus. Moths, 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 okay, it's fully enunciated. Um, if we use a dental T and go flat, moths, moths, thus, thus. So now instead of trying to do this thus transition, um, and you know, trying to get that TH nice and good and then switch over to the S, just like slide it up into the S, um, which you should be able to do if you need to clearly enunciate the word for some reason, but you know, that's just ideal. The easier way to do it and probably the more common way to do it is again to go here for this dental T and then just push the S through that position. Ma, so there's a little bit of pressure there because that's where the dental T part is. Um, where in months, months, we don't need as much pressure because we're, we're kind of using the dental N since there's an N in that word um, and kind of just ignoring the TH or the dental part, uh, the dental T part. So moths, moths, perfectly fine. Very common way to say it. For mouths, um, fully enunciated would either be mouths with a voiceless TH or mouths with a voiced TH. A um, little bit difficult to say. You can do a dental T, mouths, mouths, or you can do a dental D, mouths, mouths, okay? Dz, dz, tz, tz, dz, dz, tz, tz, okay? So you're just doing that dental and then pushing the S or the, uh, the Z through it, and you kind of like pull your tongue back a little bit into that position. Uh, but it's easier because you don't have to coordinate like th, s, right? It's like you just go flat and then you just, as you pull off, you get into that S, S slash Z position, which is the same position. Uh, what about words ending in DTH? This is a trick, so with, with, with. Remember, a normal D will never be replaced with the dental version. The dental version only replaces the THs, which means that the D in this word has to be a normal D. It's not going to be here. It has to be here. Okay. Um, now, that being said, you can slide from that D with, with, with. So instead of doing with, which would be more clearly enunciated, width, where we release that D. Um, it's just a weak D, we release it, go into a nice clear TH. You can go into the D position, um, and this creates sort of a little stop kind of, width, width, right? And then you just immediately slide that width, and you have to do a normal TH here. This is one case where you can't do the dental um, because of the D. That that's before it's just it, it wouldn't work if you try to do like a d and then a d like with d with d with d it's just it, it's it's weird. Um, now if you had an s after it with 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 that can maybe work, but we're gonna go into the d, kind of stop it a little bit, slide forward until we get that coming out with with. I'm just sliding my tongue down until that opens up a bit width, 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 width. So I go from the D, slide down into that position. Um, so that's a tricky one. Uh, yes, okay, blah, blah, blah. Uh, which phrase is correct? My sister is taller than me or, yeah. You know, uh, I need to make grammar videos. Um, like seriously, when the English acts grammar uh, videos start coming out, I think my channel is just going to explode because there's so many things that you guys are taught that are just like, just not right for, for the way people actually speak. Um, and it bugs me. Okay. So uh, I'm quite confused because this grammar website says then me is incorrect. Yeah. Why? Cause it's a grammar website. 
Um, and of course, you know, most grammar resources uh, are very super technically accurate, even though most people don't speak that way anymore. Um, I've been saying then me my whole life. Okay, this particular point. So I always, <laughs> I always double check it because in, in English, I'm, I'm never entirely sure because I, I just speak like a normal person, not like, you know, a grammar book. Um, but I always compare it to Spanish because I know in Spanish, um, they would still use the proper thing. Right. Um, so like if I say um, taller than me, right, uh, más alto que yo, yo is I, not me, right? Me in, in Spanish would be uh, me. It's literally the, the same word just spelled with an I. Um, so they don't say más alto que mí, they say más alto que yo, right, taller than I. Um, and that's how English, technically you can still say it that way. It sounds kind of sophisticated and fancy. There's nothing wrong with it. It is grammatically correct. You can add the M after it, taller than I am. Um, remember that if if you have a case like this, you can't contract because it's at the end of the sentence. Um, so there's not taller than I'm, that doesn't work. Um, but taller than I, taller than I am. If you add the M, it sounds a little less sophisticated. It sounds pretty normal. So it, that's there's nothing wrong with that. You can say I or I am, it works, okay? But saying taller than me, is probably the single most common way to say it, and it's the way most people speak. And because of that, um, again, remember, I, I tell you guys, you guys ask me certain questions, and I say, okay, there's certain grammar points that are changing. Some of them are in the early process. Um, some of them are in the middle process. Some of them are almost completely changed. This is a point, uh, and sometimes the change doesn't lead to a replacement. It leads to, at least temporarily, it leads to both coexisting at the same time where they both sound perfectly fine. That's the case here, um, which means that I don't care if it's grammatically incorrect. If most speakers are speaking this particular way, then it might as well be grammatically correct. It's, it's basically the same as being grammatically correct. Um, so, because uh, eventually it will be grammatically correct. <laughs> Give it another 100, 200 years. Um, so, when we say uh, taller than me, 100%, no problem. Just, just, just say it. There's no problem with that. Um, but taller than I am also sounds perfectly fine. We will use that as well. Um, saying taller than I, again, we will also use that, but that sounds maybe a little bit sophisticated, a little bit old, dated, um, without the M. So multiple answers here, multiple correct answers. Um, with great English fluency comes great responsibility. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you for your answer, you're welcome. Thank you for simple English, David, yes, and okay, blah, 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 do, 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 do. Uh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, you're so me when I'm dealing with phone calls to schedule appointments, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, my phone, oh, I dropped my pen. My phone vibrated and it distracted me. Um, and there it goes again. I don't know if you guys can hear that. Uh, does TH get canceled? Um, I guess you'd use the term canceled. I would, I would use dropped. Um, but does TH get canceled after a word ending? Oh my God, why does my phone keep vibrating? Hold on, this is bugging me. Why am I getting so many... Too many things. All at once, too many things. Okay. Which, by the way, guys, today I have a strict cutoff, which is going to be 2, 2 p.m. my time. It's 1.08 p.m., so we have about 50 minutes, 50, 5, um, So keep that in mind, please. Um, looks like I'm finally catching up, which is good. Um, but we it, today has to be a very strict cutoff because I have something I need to go do um, with a strict deadline. Uh, does th get can Oh yes. So does th? Do we drop the th after a word ending with s? Um, okay. Good question. This is called shifting. It's a form of linking. I call it shifting. Um, if you look it up, you want to look for um, what is it called? I can't think of it right now. Not articulation. That's not the right word. Assimilation. Okay, that's what it's, assimilation has a couple different kinds. I don't like the term assimilation. I don't use it because it's it's a big fancy word that can be confusing. Um, I call it shifting. Uh, so when we have an S followed by a voiceless TH, 
um, if you, if you fully pronounce, if you pronounce it clearly, you're going to say both of them, this thing, this thing, and that's, that's fine. Right. But what will commonly happen is we'll shift. Um, the TH will disappear. This thing, this thing, this thing, this thing. Now, if you're speaking more slowly, more clearly, it's going to sound weird. Okay. So you have to be speaking fast enough to do this. Um, so like, I like, I like this thing. I like this thing. I like this thing. It's okay. Um, and sometimes what we'll do just to make it a little clear, we'll kind of like, we won't go fully into the TH. We'll kind of like slide just a little bit towards it. Like I like, I like this thing, this. S, s, s. So it's, it's just that little tiny shift makes it very clear that the TH is there. Um, just because the S and the voiceless TH can sound very similar and depending on what it is. Like if you say, I like this thing, this thing, this thing, it can kind of sound like the sing, which doesn't make any sense. So it's fine. But anyway, yeah, things like that can happen. Um, but if you want to be clear, you want to pronounce that TH at least a little bit. Um, he says, nice to meet you. And she says, you too. Now the last sentence is related to the first one. But what happens when somebody says, I don't know, and somebody else says, me neither? Ah, good question. Always good questions. Einstein gets, gets just like like the special badge of, of awesomeness for like every question you ask is just like, I mean, not that everybody else doesn't ask great questions, but like Einstein's consistently, it's like everything that Einstein's put, it's just like fantastic question. Um, okay. Uh, because these are big common problems based on things that you guys maybe are taught wrong or that are extra confusing. Um, so now, do, 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 okay. So nice to meet you, you too. Okay. So we use two for positive, right? Um, two is not used for negative. So if you want to say, I don't, right, or it's not nice to meet you, <laughs> right? Uh, we either not going to use anything there or, you know, if, if there's some negative, so they say, oh, I don't like uh, dogs and say, oh, me neither, not me too. Okay. Now, if you say me too, I don't like dogs, me too. <sighs> it, it doesn't quite sound right. It sounds okay. Um, cause a lot of people are, are starting to, to speak that way. Maybe two will just become the thing we say at some point. Um, I think that might be something that's changing also, but it does sound kind of uneducated and formal. Um, you're not supposed to use two with a negative. So, um, if it's negative, you're supposed to use me, either me, neither, or me either. Now, either is supposed to be positive. Okay. So in your response, because your sentence doesn't have a negative, like I don't like it either, okay, then you have to say either, not neither, because then it's two negatives and English doesn't like two negatives, um, even though informally you can use them. Um, but uh, if you don't add that verb, say like I don't like it either, you, you just say me neither, like me too, me neither, whatever, um, then it has to be an N so that we know it's negative, right? But it doesn't have to be. It's supposed to be. <laughs> I said it has to be, but it actually, it's just supposed to be. Um, one thing that is very, very common that is happening um, is that people will just use either, regardless of whether it's positive or negative, in this type of response. Okay. So I don't know. Me either. Perfectly normal, perfectly common, technically not accurate, but you will hear that all the time. Okay. Sometimes we will say the end, me neither. It happens. It's what's supposed to happen. It's the correct way. Um, so they kind of both exist. Um, but be careful because that doesn't apply to all uses of either or neither. Um, cause if I say, um, I neither like it nor dislike it, that's where you're supposed to use neither nor, right? Um, if you use that structure, it has to be neither. We wouldn't say I either like it or dislike it. Cause that sounds like a different statement. Like either you like it or you dislike it. Like you have one of those two options. You can't pick both. Or if you say, I neither like it nor dislike it. Now it sounds like both of those options are, are not true, right? You, you don't like it and you don't dislike it. It's just neutral. So two completely different meanings, depending on if you use neither or either. Um, so we're just talking about in this like little short response based on what somebody else said. Um, you can just kind of never use neither and it's fine. Just use either. Uh, I've noticed some Americans say eating with a glottal stop. 
Okay, I know what you're talking about. Uh, yes, so see, here's the thing, right? Because I, I think it was you asked a question similar to this, like with, with writing, right? Um, it's the same thing with the T, right? Just like um, mountain can be a stop and garden can be a stop, stop D, stop T, stop D, okay? It's exactly the same here because when, we, when we're not adding that ing or in, um, to the verb and we're, we're making it sort of that shorter, more informal in with where we write with apostrophe. Again, that's that's informal sounding, okay? Um, when we use that version, now we can apply that same rule of why we can use the glottal stop in mountain or Britain or Latin. It becomes the same. So you can say eaten, cutten, writen, jotten, jolten. So it, 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 there you go, now it's the same. Um, but that's only if you're using the informal form of the ing uh, verbs, um, pronouncing it with i plus a regular n. Um, so good question, yes, very good question. Um, I've heard neither do I. Okay, that does exist, I don't either. That also exists because the don't is already negative. Uh, me neither, yes, or me either, yeah. All of those exist, they're all perfectly fine. We use all of those. Um, so I guess the last one, me either, is related to the don't thing, and someone gets to think neither could be double negative. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, the, and the reason why, like in your response, you can just say me either is because the person said don't. So you're just basing off of that negative instead of the negative in your sentence, which is how the grammar is supposed to work. You're basing it off of their don't. Um, and so you could just use either, it doesn't matter. Um, but good, so yeah, many different ways that you can reply, right? I mean, exactly the same thing. Neither do I, I don't either, me neither, me either. It doesn't matter, they're all the same. Um, uh, I know I have to use me neither, but I'm kind of curious where that comes from. Yeah, based on the negative. Um, which of the following would you go for? Yeah, because remember, when we use nor or neither, instead of or or either, which nor and neither, especially nor, they're, they're kind of fading from the language. Uh, but the reason why we add the, the N, um, notice, right, we have the word ever and we have the word never. Ever means like, like, have you ever done this? Like at any point in your life, you know, have you done this? And you say, I have never done this. So never, negative ever, right? Not ever. I have not ever done this. I have never done this. In, at any point in my life. Okay, so never is the negative of ever. We add the N and it becomes negative. Same thing with nor, same things with neither. We add the N, it becomes negative. Um, so that, that's why those exist, um, is to make, make those words negative. Which of the following would you go for if you were to fully enunciate and stress the word accept? So fully enunciate and stress. Two possibilities. So we have accept, 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 accept. Okay, um, if I were to fully enunciate it, which I know it's kind of weird to say that there's two possibilities here, um, but I could definitely see either one if I'm if I'm trying to stress it or enunciate it very clearly, either one of these could come out. Um, it would be um, either, like I don't accept that. So probably it, I don't accept that, accept. Or um, maybe the ac, um, which is uncommon if you're like, we would, we, I don't think we would ever say it that way if you weren't fully enunciating, but I don't accept that, Ex I don't accept that, accept that. Um, maybe we'll get lazy and go into the ick, I don't know, whatever. But for me, it would probably be ick more likely, um, but it could be ac, you know. Um, accept, accept, I don't accept that. Yeah, it could also be a schwa, but if you're enunciating, it's probably not gonna be uck. Like that's, that would be weird. I don't accept that. Yeah. Um, I assume three would be unlikely due to how much it sounds like accept. So that word could be, that, that fully enunciated would be accept with e. Eh. Um, it can reduce to accept or accept with a, a schwa. Um, and would a native speaker stress the first syllable that's usually unstressed under normal circumstances? Um, 
Under normal circumstances, no, very unlikely. Um, it's it's possible. It's definitely possible. Um, it remember it's, it's dynamic. So if if there's a particular word, like they may not necessarily stress it. Um, stress the first syllable. It's usually unstressed. No, but they might use the um, like the fully enunciated sound without stressing it. So like if we say accept, um, see I'm not saying like accept, right? That would be like a special case. Like I'm really emphasizing the whole thing. Um, but if like it, it could come out as X, even if it's not stressed um, instead of reducing the sound itself. So that can happen, but under normal circumstances giving extra stress to the unstressed syllable, like I don't, I would say no. Uh, could you get away with pronouncing moths like moss in faster speech? Yes, absolutely. The TH can just disappear. Yeah, I hate moss. I hate moss. I hate moss. 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 Sounds exactly like moss. As long as the context is clear what you're talking about, because if, if, if I just randomly say I hate moss, maybe you'll think of moths or maybe you'll think of moss. Like whichever one comes, you know, it happens to come into your brain is probably whichever one you, you think I'm talking about. Um, but if it's clear, like say we're outside and there's a, a light on and there's a moth flying into the light and I say, I hate moss. It's very clear which one I'm talking about. So it doesn't matter. Um, cancel the TH. <laughs> yeah, we should probably do that. Um, we stand strict deadlines. Yeah, good. Um, I need more of those in my life. <laughs> uh, no, cancel the ng sound. It sounds like the villager from Minecraft. <laughs> Not that I play it though. Yeah, really. Um, speaking of that, um, I don't know if you guys are Gabriel specifically, um, if you've ever heard of something called villager news from a, a YouTube channel called The Crack. It's super, super funny. I haven't watched their stuff in like a long time, but um, they were doing like all this Minecraft parody where they like, they were, you know, giving voices to the, the villagers and stuff. And um, it's always like this, like it's a stupid voice and they did villager news and it's just, it's so funny. It's so funny. Um, but yeah, the actual villagers in actual Minecraft, right? They don't actually speak like, mm, 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 or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, I also noticed native speakers tend to switch the to the present tense to describe past events. Under what circumstances can I shift to tense? Uh, yes, so this is not... I don't want to describe this. It's it's a common thing that can happen. Yes, there, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, I wouldn't say it's the default thing to do. Like if the event is in the past, we, the past tense exists exists for a reason. Um, this is called the narrative present. Um, I'm pretty sure it's called the narrative present, uh, and it's used to make a story sound more lively. So you know, right? Say like, okay, so you know, oh, I was in I was in Japan one time, right? And so uh, I'm there and this guy walks up to me. Okay. So I already said it like, you know, I'm not talking about right now. Obviously I'm telling you a story. This isn't happening right now. Right. In fact, I don't even have to say I was in Japan. I can say, all right, so I'm in Japan. Right. And this guy walks up to me. Clearly this isn't happening now because I'm telling you. <laughs> um, and so it, it makes the story sound more alive, sound more real and direct, like it's like like it is happening now. But obviously, you know, it's not happening now. So it just makes it more engaging. Um, and yeah, that that's that's all it is. Um, so you can switch to that if you want, but you need to be consistent. If you're using the narrative present, you can't say like, "So I'm in Japan. This guy walks walks up to me, um, and he gave me five dollars." Like, maybe sometimes that can work, but it's kind of like, okay, why are you switching to the past? Like, and he gives me five dollars, right? It's it's gonna sound better if you're more consistent like that. Um, sometimes maybe depending on how the speaker s switches their thoughts, they might switch in and out a little bit, but generally it needs to be consistent. Um, oh my God, you're right, uh, Gabriel. I don't even know what, what you guys are talking about. Oh, the only sound of Minecraft. Uh, the following phrase doesn't make sense to me. Theris, welcome Theris. Um, 
to understand why this is, we're going to journey through science, chemistry, blah, blah, blah. In this case, isn't it required to have a subject or something after the is, like blank, 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 or dot, 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 blank, blank, blank. <laughs> I was going to say blank and then dot, dot, dot at the same time. Um, like why this is like that, why this is that way, or is it implicit because he made an introduction before it was a video about why blue is so rare in nature. Oh yeah, I've seen that video. Um, Oh, I see. Yes, so it's implicit. We, you wouldn't say this if something wasn't like, so he states something, right? Okay, this is a fact. And then why, right? Okay, so to understand why this is, meaning why fact is, right? So you could replace it with the fact. So let's say he says, um, I don't know, I don't remember the details of that video, but let's say I say um, space is cold, right? Um, and I say, okay, to understand why space is cold, right, you just replace the fact there. Um, but instead of that, you use this is, meaning why this exists, why this is true. You don't have to add anything after that, it's just why this is. Um, and it implies why it exists, why it's this way, um, why that's true. Whatever phrase you want to put in there, um, we don't have to actually add the whole thing. You can just say why this is. Because I understand why that can be kind of confusing. But yeah, it's just replacing the fact um, that was stated. Uh, now, can you say to understand why this is like that? You could. It sounds unnecessary, um, so we probably wouldn't, but you could. Um, or to understand why this is that way. Again, you could, it sounds very unnecessary. It's like you're just adding, you're being redundant, like because this is already replaces the fact. And so you're saying like, why space is cold that way? Or like why space is cold is cold that way? Like it's it just, it, it seems to, add extra implication that doesn't need to be needed because you're kind of like repeating it with, with those phrases. Um, it's just extra, it doesn't, we don't need it. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, we're out of questions. Guys, we still have like a half an hour. You, 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 you let me catch up too soon. That's okay. Um, I have so many things here. Um, Oh, yay. That works perfectly. Um, probably. Any other questions? Questions, questions. Um, if not, I can try to talk about something or just end. <laughs> That's always a possibility. Um, I've been thinking a lot about pacing recently. I've been making a video on pacing. Um, so I already have a particular order because I told certain people that I was going to make certain videos at certain times. Um, I just did the Held versus Glottal. I think that I'm pretty sure the next one I'm doing is um, End of Word Devoicing or whatever it's called. Um, so how like dog can kind of sound like doc in a way. Um, or especially with the S, um, so it was like dogs instead of a, a solid Z. It kind of sounds like S, like uh, I like dogs. Right? It actually ends in an S, but it starts in a Z. If you do a straight S, it, it, it's it's not right. It sounds weird. So I'm going to be making a lesson on that. Probably that's going to be the next one. Um, and then I still have things to get to. I haven't gotten to. Um, I'm kind of thinking, you guys can let me know what you think about this. Because uh, it seems like when I do the shorts, um, I mean, like, obviously, the shorts is on a, they're on a different algorithm. And so it can get me more exposure from people who otherwise might not see the regular videos. But um, 
I'm kind of thinking, because the shorts are supposed to be like short little things that, you know, are their own little thing. And it's a good format. But um, I kind of feel that they, they end up getting lost. Like, I'm pretty sure on my channel page, there should be like a link that fits like the shorts, like all the shorts I've made or something. But I, I don't think people, like maybe uh, some people probably go in and watch those. I don't know. Um, but they're just kind of like these small extra things that I don't think a lot of people go through. So do you guys like actually use the shorts? Like not just when I publish them, but like, you know, like you go and explore, oh, hey, he has other shorts. Um, I'm kind of thinking instead of doing the shorts, um, like if I'm answering questions, I can just do like a and a video where I just like take recent questions and like answer them in a video. Um, and because it's not a super long live stream like this, like I will actually break it into section timestamps so that you can just find things easily. Um, I think that might be better. But then I also have like the the fill in the blank listening, which I could just do, you know, like several of them in, in one video instead of doing them in each, a short each. So I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that, uh, like if the shorts format would be better for some things or if I should just like not worry about the shorts and just make it all regular videos and whatever. But you guys are dead, everything's dead. Talk to me. I'm so lonely. Not really. Um, what else do we have here? <laughs> yeah. Close that. That's not what I want. Take the headphones off. Don't need these. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what to talk about, guys. Could you please say, please? Could you please say the sentence in the most lazy way possible with the least amount of enunciation? Maybe. Um, okay. And you want me to say it in the most lazy way possible with the least amount? I mean, if I'm gonna go as lazy as possible, it's gonna just, it's gonna be, it's gonna be mumbling, but um, okay. Like within normal bounds, right? I don't know, I'm reading, so that's probably gonna affect it, but. Bats and bets sound alike, but bag and beg are clearly different. Bats and bets sound alike, but bag and beg are clearly different. Bats and bets are sad. Bat, bats and bets sound alike, but bag and beggar is clearly different. I don't know how good that was for least amount. Of, if I were to clearly enunciate it, bats and bets sound alike, but bag and beg are clearly different. So the way I was saying it was obviously much less enunciated than that. <laughs> Maybe if I just try to say it a little more quickly, because that's also going to bring down the enunciation and make it lazier. Um, bats and bets sound alike, but bag and beggar is clearly different. Bats and bets sound alike, but bag and beg are clearly different. They all sound clearly different to me. <laughs> um, the shorts are awesome, by the way. Can you add them into a unique playlist, or is that not possible? I do think that the format could help. Makes this for sure. Yeah, well, that's just the thing, because I'm really confused. On my end, it tells me that I have a shorts playlist. But then I go to my channel, and it doesn't seem to show it. I don't know if it does now, but when I checked it, it wasn't on there. So I don't know if it's because the shorts are still new um, or if I have to manually add them to a special playlist, but it's, it's at least on my end, it, it puts them all into a thing. And so I'm just like, I don't know. Um, I think, you know, my God, you're going the extra mile and providing the enunciated version as well. Well, yeah, we got a comparison. <laughs> um, that's just like, that's not even the extra mile. That's just basics. <laughs> um, I don't see the playlist. Let's see if there's something I can do. Because um, I'm pretty sure. Let's see if I go customization. Yeah, see, it's, it's I can't show you my screen, but it, it says it right here. Because if I go to, there's a button for customization where I can 
um, put like the channel trailer, the video for returning subscribers, and then featured sections. And that's where I can put like a bunch of playlists and stuff. And so it has like popular uploads, the American pronunciation playlist, logical preposition playlist, build your own path, uh, the English fluency playlist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then it says shorts videos, 58. So there's a list for it right here in front of me that should be showing on my channel. It even shows a, a list of the live stream videos in a playlist. But then if I go to my channel, which I can actually do here, and see home. Okay, so it says live now because I'm live. Popular uploads, American pronunciation, logical prepositions, same order, everything. Oh, I see the shorts. It's showing up on my page. Weird, now it's actually showing. But you don't see it. Like if you go, are you on the, um, like you go to my channel page and it's the home tab. Because if you go to playlists, um, it might not pop up because I haven't made a specific playlist for it. But if you go to home and you scroll down, you should see a section that says shorts. For some reason that wasn't popping up for me before, but now it is. Um, Yep, I lost one short of yours that I really want to watch again. Um, okay, well, as I said, see if it's on the homepage of my channel. Um, I'll give you a link here for easy access. You should just be able to push the little profile button anyway, but um, you just scroll down a little bit, and it should be right there. Um, if it's not, then I think that's a glitch that they're probably going to have to fix. Oh, yeah, it's on the home page. Yeah. Um, I don't know why they wouldn't put it on the playlist page also. Like, that just kind of makes sense um, so that I don't have to, like, create a special playlist for it. Um, now, what I, what I do do with the shorts, right, so there's, like, the fill-in-the-blank listening shorts, and so I have a playlist for those specific shorts. It's the fill-in-the-blank listening playlist. Um, so I do try to put the shorts into different playlists based on their content, um, and you can find them that way. But if you want all the shorts, um, then uh, you have to find that on the homepage, apparently. Anyway. Uh, so much stuff. Uh, they're all there. Thank you. No problem. Uh, when it's someone else question i might learn something but it's more likely that i'll forget yeah so someone else's someone else so we still have an apostrophe s someone else's question but it's more likely i'll forget yeah that can happen <laughs> um oh i see you posted something before that that makes more sense um i love to watch uh, some shorts, it's straightforward to the point, so I don't have to watch a full video. I learn more when it's an inherent question that I have. When it's someone else's question, I mean, yeah, exactly, okay. Um, which, by the way, so it should be an inherent. Um, and we will still commonly pronounce it that way, like by default, that's the way that it should be, and that's the way we usually pronounce it. But many natives are uh, commonly breaking that rule and just saying like uh, inherent. I will even do it myself sometimes, but more often than not, that N will very naturally pop up between A and a vowel. Um, and then in writing, you definitely should write the N. Um, it just, it doesn't look good in writing. But in speech, technically, informally, I guess you can drop it, but it's, it's something that's probably changing. Um, it's in the early stages of changing. <sighs> okay, good. Um, there's so much stuff. So I finally got a video out yesterday, right? Last night. Took me forever, I know. Um, and then... Oh, I'm so tired, guys. Ugh, so tired. Oh, that trip really took a lot. Um, 
but yeah, I got everything done with the cards that I was doing. Back to normal, pretty much. Got that video made. Um, I'm definitely going to try not to let it be two weeks before I make another video. Um, and I won't go into details, but since I mentioned about it before, um, I will mention that the... Um, issue, the possible ADHD issue I mentioned before. Again, I won't go into details, but there is some form of progress on that front. And we will see what happens uh, over the next few months. But um, yeah, and hopefully that can also make things a lot easier for me and make it easier to be more consistent. Because I know you guys are waiting for all the great lessons I'm going to be making. There's just so much. So many videos. I have a whole list. I still have a whole list of pronunciation videos. And that's just pronunciation. It's not even grammar. <laughs> like, I'm never going to run out of content. Um, and I still have all those extra practice lessons to make, too. Anyway, it never ends. It'll never end. But we're over 3,000 subscribers now, which is fantastic. We are well on our way on up. Um, I also recently hit 10,000 hours of watch time, which is insane, because it took me a year and a half to reach 4,000, and it's only been six more months, and I've more than doubled that. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're definitely growing a little bit faster, a little bit faster. Um, the watch time doesn't matter too much anymore, I guess, um, for monetization. But obviously, I want to keep you guys watching. I want to make it engaging, blah, blah, blah. Um, about 3,000 subs. Uh, my next goal is 10,000. Where will we be at 10,000? Um, OK. Is Funky, one of those words that has a lot of different meanings, because I've seen it a few times here and there, and I never know what it really means. Funky smell, my idea of seeing people's reaction is that it smells bad, but this phrase, you have your own funky language for things, like this is actually coriander, not cilantro. The list is kind of endless, really. Um, OK, so what does it mean in that case? Uh, funky does have a number of different meanings, yes. Um, Actually, funky is a funky word. <laughs> um, <laughs> a little bit recursive there. So, uh, you're correct. It can mean funky smell, meaning uh, bad. Like it, it is bad, but it's it's it adds a little extra to it rather than like just being bad. It's like. It's, it's not just bad, it's strange. Like, it smells strange, right? <laughs> um, and I guess it it doesn't have to necessarily be bad. Like, it could just be strange. Like, well, I kind of like it, but it's strange. Like, eh, it smells kind of funky. Um, but usually it's going to be bad. Yeah, we, we tend to use it with, for, for bad. But it has that little extra bit to it. Um, now, when we say, okay, your own funky language. So funky funky is, is basically a synonym for, like, weird or strange. Um like at, at the core of it. And so it can be applied in different contexts that the resulting meaning, kind of like the, with the prepositions, the resulting meaning may be like completely different. Um, so when we say, oh, you have your own funky language, it's not like a bad language, but it still has that idea of like, like weird or strange. Like you have, you have your own little special language that is, you know, different than everybody else's, right? Um, so that, that's all that means. Um, it's, it's funky because it's not normal, right? It's not the normal language that people use, uh, in that case. Um, anyway, yeah, funky can also, I think funky originally came from the seventies. Um, and the, the traditional way that it was used, it, it, um, I, I'm pretty sure it was a synonym for cool. Um, like, yeah, man, that's that's funky, you know, like funky, groovy. Like, I'm not completely sure because it's from the 70s. 
Um, I didn't grow up in the seventies, but, um, we kind of get that sort of vibe from it. Like, it's like, it's like kind of cool. Like, Oh yeah. You know, cause like there's that song, right. Play that funky music, white boy. <laughs> right. If you ever heard that, that song, um, so it's funky music. It's like, yeah, right. Funk. Funk is like, a, it's actually a musical genre. <laughs> um, so that's probably where it originally comes from, but now it, it generally means like strange. Uh, I have yet to watch the video on stop, but I'm sure I'll love it. Uh, will you be celebrating Halloween? Uh, yeah, actually, David, it'd, it'd be interesting to see your opinion on it because, um, you'll see what I mean <laughs> when you watch it. Um, but it, it'll definitely be interesting to see your opinion on it. Um, will you be celebrating Halloween? Uh, I don't really celebrate holidays particularly. Um, for Thanksgiving and Christmas, I'll go over and, and see family. Um, Halloween, we're going to have a, I guess, a party. Like some people are coming over and we're going to have a, a bonfire and hang out and whatever. Um, usually we don't do that. And when I say we're doing that, I mean, like, I'm going to be there, but like, I'm not planning it. I'm not really doing anything for it. It's like my roommates are setting all that up. I'm just here. <laughs> uh, so yeah, definitely not dressing up. You know, I'm just going to be me. So I'm already scary enough. Right. No need for a costume. Um, yeah, I don't really care. Like Halloween, Valentine's day. Like I definitely don't give, give candy out to kids. I don't care. I don't want them coming to my house and knocking on the door and bugging me, you know, every five minutes <laughs> throughout the night. It's like, sorry, no, <laughs> go away. <laughs> so no, I don't really do much for, for that. Um, Valentine's day. I mean, I guess if I'm with somebody, that's a different thing, but usually Valentine's day, no St. Patrick's day, no, um, 4th of July. I usually don't even do anything. It's just okay. New year's. I don't usually do anything. So I'm just a dull person. <laughs> uh, do people still trick or treat on the streets? Yes. Uh, please say yes. I'd be really crestfallen if you say no. Yes, yes, I do. Um, I don't pay too much attention to it. It does seem to me like maybe there's less of it, but that could just be because I'm in my thirties and turn my light off. So the kids don't come to my door. <laughs> um, I remember one year was there was a lot because my roommate wanted to give out candy and there was just like kids and kids and kids and kids and kids. And then the next year there was like nobody. <laughs> so I don't know, but yeah, it still happens. Um, there's going to be this doll from the squid game walking around on Halloween, on Halloween, on Halloween, on Halloween. Might've been a typo, but on Halloween. But also by the way, pronunciation um, of Halloween, um, First on, because it's 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 a day, right? It's like on the calendar, on a particular day, on Monday, same thing, on Halloween. Um, you could say during Halloween, technically, but uh, we're not really saying in Halloween. Um, that's kind of creepy. For a girl from, or a, a doll from Squid Game walking around. That's creepy. Um, anyway, but yeah, Halloween. So you'll hear people say Halloween, and you'll, see, you'll hear people say Halloween. Both are fine just in case you're curious. <laughs> um, I don't say Halloween. Um, some people do. And that, it's, it's sort of like some people say one, some people say the other. Uh, maybe some people say both. Um, usually when there's a case like that, I, I'll just say both and whichever one comes out is whatever one comes out. But I don't, I don't think I ever say Halloween. It's kind of weird to me. Um, so I use ah that merged ah, um, Halloween. Do you begin, begin, and begun all sound the same when spoken lazily, maybe replacing the last vowel in each one with the schwa? No. Because if that were the case, then we wouldn't know which one, we're which one you're talking about. Um, plus, in addition to that, um, that the last, the second syllable where that last vowel is, is the stress syllable. So begin has to be I, began has to be a, and begun has to be a. And especially because begun uses a, which is the not true schwa, it's upside down V, but it's, it's basically, this is a schwa sound. Um, if you were to try to use a in the other ones, we would just think it's the third one. 
So it, it, it's not going to work. Um, begin, 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 begin. Now, that being said, there are lazy ways to make sounds that aren't clearly enunciated, like eh can be kind of lazy. Instead of like begin, it could be like begin, 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 and that's not quite a schwa. That's like maybe halfway, like we're kind of letting it slide back a little bit from eh to uh. It's actually not a sound in English, um, but it's close enough to eh that we would identify it as begin. Um, so things like that can happen, but it, it wouldn't completely go in, into a schwa, no. Uh, France with, okay, to me, AH is the transcription for the IPA AE symbol. Um, because there's a, a, H, and there's a, a, W, which is the merged a, a. Um, some teachers use a, H to refer to the unmerged a, um, and then a, W to refer to the unmerged a. I don't do that. Um, but France has a, um, and then we have that whole N after it where there's a little extra nasal or there's a little nasal to it. Um, there's usually a bit of like raising of the tongue. So it's going to sound a little bit different than a straight A sound, but it's, it's still an A. It's, base, it's the same basic sound. Uh, France. Um, now, would it be France? So I, what you're asking is, is it France or France, right? Um, if we want to try to imitate a French sound for whatever reason, um, just to, you know, play with the language, um, then we'll use ah, because I don't know if they actually use a sound that's similar to ah in French to refer to France, um, but we imagine it at least to be something like France, 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 so it's like ah, right? And we'll just use an R, we'll say France, or France, France, right? The Tour de France. Um, and I think some people do say it that way, uh, maybe it, more in British English, I don't know, but I haven't, I don't think I've really heard an American like seriously say France. Like, have you ever been to France? Like, it, it sounds kind of weird, like you're trying to be special or like you're trying to like, oh, look, I'm so sophisticated because I'm saying it this way. Like, that's kind of how it feels to me. Um, so it would be, ah, yeah, France. Tell me, oh, you're not dull at all. And B, I laughed so much when you started talking about the children with the dead fan delivery. It wasn't even deadpan delivery. It was like I just I, I hate the kids. <laughs> um, all these things, the buzzing on the phone and the annoying, the distracting me. Anyway, uh, if you don't give candies away, um, which by the way it should be candy, but uh, it's really funny because like I'm used to saying candies now, like it sounds okay to me, but like growing up, um, like I already knew it's supposed to be candy. Like the there, I don't think there really is a plural necessarily. Like maybe in certain contexts, but here it should be like give candy away. Like we would just say candy. Like in general, is like like a general uh, thing. Uh, but a lot of Hispanic speakers or speakers like with with a Hispanic background, even if like they were born here or whatever, they say candies, and that really stuck out to me when I was younger, when I was in like middle school, and now I just kind of like use it. Like it might be candy or candies, whichever one comes out, it doesn't matter. But it, in English, it should be candy um, in most circumstances. Um, but anyway, that aside, uh, if you don't give uh, candy away, do they just TP or Thrax? <laughs> yeah, for those of you who don't know what TP, um, TP stands for toilet paper. And obviously it's where like they throw rolls of toilet paper and it gets all over your house and everything. Um, like it's portrayed in the movies. Uh, no, I've never experienced that. Um, I'm sure some people do. Uh, I don't think it's it's really like they don't give you candy. It's just like sometimes teenagers, like they don't care about the candy. They just want to cause, you know, problems. And it's like, oh, it's a fun thing. Oh, yeah, you know, we don't get to do this usually. It's like special night. Let's go, you know, throw eggs or whatever. So some people probably still do that. I don't know. Um, that was probably much more common in the 80s and maybe the 90s. Um, I'm sure people still do it. But I've never personally experienced that myself. So I don't know. Um, instead of dull, can I say lightweight? <sighs> no. No. Um, so in the way that I use dull, talking about a dull person, definitely not. I was trying to think of, like, if we use dull in a different meaning, could you use lightweight and still no? Because um, dull, you could have, like, say, if you have a knife or something and it's it's not sharp, 
the opposite of sharp is dull, right? Um, but that wouldn't mean lightweight, right? It has nothing to do with the weight of the knife. Um, so no, they're not they're not synonyms. Um, maybe there's a context or a meaning of dull that I'm just not thinking of. So if you can give me an example, but I would say no. Uh, honestly, I'd probably have difficulty deciding what is and isn't a controversial costume to wear these days, seeing how people on Twitter tend to complain <laughs> about everything. Is, yeah, I know, right? Yeah. Um, eh. Whatever. I mean, just wear whatever you want to wear. <laughs> That's what I would say. If people have a problem with it, then deal with that when it comes up. Uh, for the Italian city... Yes. Okay. Good question. So there's actually, uh, so you're asking about the, the last syllable. Um, but so I've heard Milan. I've heard Milan. I've heard, uh, so you can use schwa, me, you can use e, me. Um, I've even heard some people say me. Um, and then the second syllable could be a uh, or a. Uh. There's, I've heard many people say it differently. Um, how do I say it? I would say Milan, Milan, Milan. So either a schwa or an i, and then ah, uh, Milan. Yeah. Um, Meadow, welcome back. Long time no see. Um, we're just about out of time, Meadow. Unfortunately, I have a very clear cutoff today in the next like three and a half minutes. So if you have a question, uh, I would try to get it in now. Uh, but yes, good to see you. Uh, welcome back. Um, Einstein says, the G disappear in background? Um, okay, good question. So it's background. Uh, you, if you over enunciate the word, like you want to make it super, super clear, you can actually separate them and say background. Uh, that's not normal. Um, but it's not necessarily that the, the uh, background, the G definitely doesn't disappear. Um, but the K can disappear. Um, or at least seem like it disappears. Um, but that's, yeah, it seems like it disappears, but it doesn't actually. So, right, because it's still ground. It's it, We don't say background. That would be a K, background, background, crown, crown. It, it sounds like crown, okay? Um, background. Like, maybe if you're using just a soft K or a weak K, like back, Background, background. I, I guess, yeah, you could do that and drop the G if it's like a really weak K because the the weak voiceless stops, P, T, and K, sound very, very, very similar to the weak voiced stops, the B, D, and G. So you can kind of get away with that, especially in faster speech. Um, but I would say that uh, the, the default would probably be where you, you stop the K and then do the, the, the G, right? So it'd be like background, background, background. Um, and if you're speaking more quickly, then you can maybe kind of drop the G, um, do a, a weak K that kind of sounds a little bit voiced and like say, oh, it's in the background, in the background, in the background. And it's gonna sound close enough that it doesn't really matter. Uh, what to use when you want to ask about percentage, like how much percent of Americans, uh, how much is the percentage of them believe in God? Uh, okay, so if you're going to use the word percent, you would say what percent? What percent of Americans or what percentage of Americans? We'd probably say what percentage. Um, or you can say how many, how many Americans. Um, but that could just be a number, right? It could be represented as a number or a percentage. So if you want the percentage specifically, um, what percentage of Americans, um, or you can say like how how many Americans in percent or in a percentage speak a second language, right? So there's different ways you can phrase it, um, but it wouldn't be how much percent. That, that that's not correct. Um, you could even say like what's the percent? What is the percent of Americans? Um, yeah. Uh, okay, we got like one minute here. You're one minute early. Yes, I know. I'll be there. Yeah. Yes, okay. Heavyweight. Um, I watched a teacher doing... Con okay, so nothing else, guys, because i got to go in like less than a minute here. Um, I watched a teacher doing connected speech with the phrase, can you tell him I called? And she connected the M from him to I, and it sounded so weird to me. Something like, can you tell him I called? 
Well, that's just standard linking. Consonants connect to vowels. Consonants always connect to vowels. So yeah, an M at the end of a word going to uh, the diphthong I would sound like my. That's just normal. It's very, very normal. Um, can you tell them? And the can would probably reduce to kin or kun. Can you? Can you? Can you tell them? Can you tell them I called? Can you tell them I called? Tell them I. Tell them I. Can you tell them I called? Yeah. That's just a normal way to say that. Um, if you try to separate those, it's going to sound weird. Um, okay, people, I got to go. Sorry if you're here late. Sorry, I got to go. No more comments. I'm going to try to finish this up really, really quick. Um, anything after Meadows' comment, I'm going to ignore, unfortunately, because I have to cut this off um, after Meadows' most recent comment. So um, sorry, Wendell. <laughs> um, I'm just going to try to answer these really, really quick. Um, and then go. Uh, okay, like this is a dull book or this is a lightweight book. Those are two completely different things. Dull would mean boring or, or, or superficial. If you say a lightweight book, uh, I mean, maybe you can use it with that meaning, possibly if the context is right, but we're gonna think it's it's a book that's not heavy. Um, or maybe it's, it's a book that um, isn't super complicated, like the language is relatively simple. Um, and so it's lightweight in terms of difficulty. Um, it could mean that, but dull wouldn't mean that. Uh, he is popular with girls. He is popular among footballer, among or with is correct. Uh, both are fine. There's no problem. Um, what percent of them are males? What we we'll probably say? What percentage? Um, he say what is the percent that are males, or what percentage? Percentage of them are males. Uh, yes, bye, Daniela. Thank you very much. Um, Wendell, can I say I'm feeling well in the present continuous tense? Yes. Depending on when you use it, it might kind of sound a little unnatural, but it's perfectly grammatically correct. Yes, I'm feeling well. Um, how are you feeling? I'm feeling well. Yeah, normal grammar. Okay, so thank you guys. Sorry, I have to cut it off. Um, you're welcome, Meadow. Um, but uh, good day today. Um, I think we had a good live stream, a little dull period, but yeah, uh, we'll be back here next week as always. And, um, I will try to get a lesson up before the next live stream. <laughs> um, thank you everybody. And I oh, yeah, Fernando's here too. Yes. Ciao Fernando. Uh, see you next time.